So good morning, everybody. We are live now. We can start. Thank you, Ashok. A uh, very, very good morning to you all, friends. Welcome to the sixth edition of weekly Sunday seminars under the aegis of Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society. This has been envisaged by our Honorable President, Dr. Ram Prabhu, about two months back. And thereafter, we have had a seminar on very interesting topics every Sunday morning. Uh, there have been really some good, interesting webinars like office pediatrics, sports injuries, uh, degenerative disorders of the spine. And when we have had very good response and viewership to the tune of 16 to 1800 for every webinar. Today, we have a very, very interesting webinar that has been put up by Dr. Tushar Jimulia and his team on how to manage an infected knee. Brother, there cannot be a bigger nightmare in our practice than a TKR which gets infected. There are so many thoughts and views of different people of different institutions about how to manage a TKR. Dr. Tushar and his team are going to conduct a threadbare discussion today right from the economic burden of infected TKR to various clinical and diagnostic criteria and management options. We are extremely delighted with, uh, to have with us two esteemed faculty, faculty from UK. We have Dr. Mukesh Himadi, who is a consultant, a hip and knee arthroplasty surgeon at Whitington. And we have Dr. Gautam Chakrabarti, who is the clinical director and consultant at Huddersfield. We also have Dr. Solanki from Jaipur. So I'm pretty sure that you will have a great session today. And at the end of the session, you will be a much wiser surgeon as regards an infected knee. I also wish to thank uh, Ashok Sham for let us use his ortho TV platform, which has really increased our outreach. And I wish to thank Fizera Nilesh who's there with us from the company to have supported us in this endeavor. So Dr. Tushar, over to you. Thank you, Satish. Thank you, Satish. I hope all of you can hear me. Good morning. Uh, the plan today is so to give you, give you an overview on infected TKR. It will be, I will be uh, Who's speaking? Please mute. Please mute. The plan today is to give you experience of the panelists along with a bit of literature. And we would like to discuss everything from the simple things which are ignored, like costing, telling the patient, the family, the cost, and then we go on to the actual surgical aspects. The first speaker, and I would like to start off is with Pranav Agarwal, who, as you all know, is practicing in the suburbs of Mumbai, and he will talk to us on the cost to the patient, the family, the society, and the surgeon, the burden of infected TKR. Over to you, Pranav. I will stop screen share now. Thank you. Just give me a minute to share my screen. Can you see my screen uh, clearly? Yes, yes, Pranav, carry on. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Pranav Agrawal. At the outset, let me thank Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society, Dr. Tushar Jimulia and Dr. Girish Devnani for giving me this opportunity to open the innings today. Uh, before we jump on to some serious number crunching, uh, which will make our meeting feel like a newsroom in the heat of uh, exit polls. Uh, let me tell you that there are three ways of treating a patient in orthopedics. My way, your way, and the correct way. Irrespective of what way we use, if this patient should end up in infection, then it is a nightmare, not just for the surgeon, but also for the patient. And often because of the fault of neither of these, that's the kind of a problem. That's the kind of a pathology that infection is. When we discuss the socioeconomic burden, let us first discuss technically what burden of revision actually is. It is defined as the ratio of implant re revisions due to infection to the total number of arthroplasties performed in a given uh, period of time within a specific population. It was first introduced by Malkow as a means to compare different joint registries. This is a definition given by the CDC in 2015. I'm referring to this because most of the articles that I'm going to quote have used this 
as a means of identifying infection. There have been some changes and upgrades to this by various congresses and some of the eminent speakers will talk about this in later slides as well. Let's see what's happening in the UK, a whopping 23 to 25% of procedures following TKR are revised because of infection and infection is the commonest in, uh, indication for revision. Uh, look, look here, see the national surveillance data from England also shows that obese patients are more susceptible to infection. And this is an important thing that we might, might want to bear in mind when, uh, when operating an obese patient and we might want to be more paranoid about infection in these patients. An extensive study from the UK, uh, which uh, looked into all of these, uh, studied about six lakh and odd knees. And they found that 0.5% of these knees were revised as compared to 0.4% of hips. But there is a, a possibility of infection even after an aseptic revision. And see, those numbers are much higher. About 2.1% of aseptic revision knees were revised and 1.5% hips after aseptic revision for infection. So if you see the 10-year cumulative incidence for revision after PJI, uh, primary is it's 0.7 and uh, aseptic 3.13 uh, as far as knees are concerned, which is about almost a three-fold increase in burden of PGI from the year 2005 until 2014, which means that it's increasing. The burden is increasing. The National Health Service said that the current rate of revision uh, in TKR for PGI is about 1,000 cases every year. And I'm going to correlate this uh, with the Indian uh, information that we have later in the presentation. The cost of revision of TKR due to PGI is more than three times the cost of a primary TKR, more than three times the cost. And the cost of revision of TKR due to PGI is also two times that of aseptic revision in TKR. And look at the last point, costs of revision in TKR due to PGI in excess of euros 30,000 per case. This is the information that we are getting from the UK. Let's see the US. If you see that table below, uh, the Days of stay in a revision TKR are 3.9, but the average days of stay in a revision for infected TKR are about 7.6. And look at the cost in US dollars, 35,000 US dollars versus 56,000 and odd US dollars. That's almost 1.5 times. And if you see those statistics in the beginning, urban non-teaching hospitals uh, reported more and more cases of infection. Urban non-teaching hospital means some of the private hospitals that we are associated with and where we do most of our good TKRs. That's the economic impact in the US. Infected TKR surgery required three to four times the resources. This is from the uh, healthcare industry point of view. In our country and in the suburbs that where we operate, most of the patients are not insured. The senior age group is not insured and they are paying from the pocket. But in the Western countries, they talk about the cost on the healthcare industry as well. It required approximately twice, twice the resources of a non-septic revision. The reimbursement by insurance companies resulted in a loss of $15,000 per case to the hospital for a group as a whole and $30,000 per case per medical patient. The annual cost of infected revisions had increased by $246 million in the decade in the first decade of 2000 and it was $566 million in 2009 alone. It is projected to exceed $1.62 billion by 2020 in the United States of America. Let's bear in mind, if we do a debridement and retention protocol to treat a single PGI, it's approximately threefold the cost of primary implantation. The average cost of one and two stage arthroplasty exchanges are 3.4 and six times higher. And this does not include the indirect societal costs cost for coming to the hospital, cost for other things, cost for litigations in these Western countries, cost for prolonged use of oral and antimicrobials, the cost incurred by these patients because they cannot reach work, they cannot go to work, they are debilitated by infection. All these costs are extra. These are only the figures which are talking about surgical costs. Let's look at the international registry-based perspective. If you see in 2015, in these, some of the better countries, say Australia, say New Zealand, say Sweden, say, the, say England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and American uh, joint registries, if we see the 2000 values, uh, 2015 values, we'll see that there is a range of 0.8% to 
to 1.2% of their knees were getting infected. So on an average, about 1%, that's one in every 100 knees were getting infected in their hands. This is another study published uh, in one of the Indian papers, but they had a cumulative reporting of single institutional and registry-based incidence of prosthetic joint infections. If we go to see here, the range is a little higher, say 0.5 until 2.1. But even so, the average comes to one in 100 patients. Here's a study from the Taipei Veterans General Hospital where they saw about 10,000 patients. And if you see here in this, uh, uh, in this table, their incidence of PJI decreased over the years from 1.93 till 0.76 in 2014. So actually the incidence is decreasing, isn't it? Is it really then? But look at this chart here. The rate for rate per 1 lakh population of hips and knees, the arthroplasties have themselves increased over the decade. So if you see in the US, 40% reduction in PGI following TKR has been reported. Similar reports we saw from the Taipei hospital. The risk of infection in patients undergoing TKR is also decreasing. But the overall frequency of TKR is increasing along with substantial burden of infection. And if we were to uh, draw a rather sordid parallel, it's something like these COVID cases. The death rate has gone down internationally. But in the second wave, because of so many people getting more and more infected, the total number of deaths as compared to the first wave have gone up. It's a sordid parallel, but that's how infection behaves. What's the scene back home? What's, what's the scene in India? These are some fancy registries where you have fancy data. But in India, we don't have that much data. Here are some of the data that I could come across. Pachore sir and their colleagues uh, uh, ran a study from 2006 to 2012, 2000 and odd. And what I did was that I extrapolated these results, uh, the percentages of infection to these 34,000 in the hand of 40 surgeons. So if we see at a 0.5% rate, then 172 of these knees would have gotten infected. And if we see from 2% point of view, 689 knees would have gotten infected. Now let us look at the ISHKS thing, uh, uh, reports. About 150 surgeons were studied and 1.2 odd lakh TKRs were studied. So uh, about 646 or about 2.5 thousand uh, TKRs would have gotten infected. Oh no. Yeah. Two okay. minutes more. Yeah. So one study said that there was a proportional increase in the costs involved in lower and income countries as well as compared to the, uh, so the total cost of that, proportional Gorbe. increase in LMIC countries was happening. Here are some of the numbers. I think somebody, there is a lot of disturbance somewhere. These are some numbers in the suburbs. Look at this. If a patient in India was to get operated in a middle level hospital, in a middle level room, and this is closer home. These are in the suburbs of uh, Mumbai. Middle level hospital, middle level room. If we did a primary TKR, and they would have about five days of stay. This is average estimated figures. Cost of stay would be 35 grand. Implant cost would be 60 grand because now there's a capping on all these implants. There would be about on an average of three days of antibiotics. Cost of antibiotics in the primary surgery would be rather low. These are the initial costs. These days, surgeons are paranoid what with extensive uh, preoperative investigations and uh, laminar airflows and body exhaust suits and antibiotic schedule and such things. Let's say with all of that, uh, they would have about three weeks of loss of work and the surgical costs eventually would be about 2.5 lakhs. Middle level hospital, middle level room. If this patient were to get infected and if this patient were to have stage one and stage two, look at what the final result is. It's about 10.5 lakhs. This is an estimate, but it's about 10.5 lakhs versus 2.5 lakhs. Four times the cost, six months out of work. So many lakhs of rupees gone into antibiotics if this patient were to receive targosid or ticoplanin or something of that sort. And not to mention income uh, deficit for six months. And who bears this burden in our country? 
Is it the insurance companies? Most of the seniors who want to undergo TKR these days in the current generation are not insured. So it is eventually a complete burden on these patients, their relatives, and the entire patient take the patient takes the entire burden. They are the real beasts of burden. So in conclusion, at best, PJIs result in additional pain, discomfort, hospital stays and treatment. At worst, they result in reoperation, long-term disability, and death. I was discussing one case with Dr. Jimulia the other day, and we know that there was a patient with a bilateral infection who eventually ended up uh, uh, spending lakhs and lakhs of rupees and eventually did not make it. So death is that worst of the result that we'll have. While rates of infection are decreasing, volumes of TKR are increasing. Infection is the major cause of revision post-TKR. And while we crunch numbers and discuss ad nauseum, the, be, uh, the beasts of this burden in India, in Mumbai, in its suburbs, the beast of burden is actually the patient and its family themselves, in our, and both socially, economically, and sometimes physically also. So the paranoia to address prevention is absolutely justified. Where we are, it's best to prevent whatever we do. Bhavna Prakash, please stop. Please make it mute. 0 0.5 to 2 percent of oh, patients yeah. are going to get. Who is Bhavna Prakash? Uh, please mute. Infected. So let me thank the Mumbai Society, uh, the Mumbai uh, Suburban Orthopedic Society, Dr. Jimulia and Dr. Devnani again for giving me this opportunity to begin this discussion. Uh, stick around with us. There are some eminent speakers coming to deal with the entire infection uh, in TKR process. Tushar, sir, over to you again. Yeah. Thank you. If you stop screen sharing. Yes. Yeah. So that was a nice talk. What we also need to know is the what happens to the, not just the cost to the patient, but also the family because of the loss of income, but also to the surgeon one has to think what is happening sleepless nights and how to prevent those sleepless nights. I will give it over to Harsha, who is another of my colleagues from the suburbs and at Cooper Hospital who will talk to us of what are the factors predisposing and hopefully how to reduce the risks. So over to you, Harshad. I'll stop screen sharing. Yeah. Harshad, you may be on mute. Harshad, we cannot hear you. Please unmute yourself. Arshad, we cannot hear you. I, I'll, I'll start in a minute. Yeah, please, please. So unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. You can hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. You can see my screen also, I guess. Yes, yes. Perfect, perfect. So uh, I'm going to talk on factors which predispose to a joint infection and totally replacement. I'm going to talk on uh, ways and means which an average orthopedic surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon working in his own private setup or in a nursing home not in a corporate situation, how to use or how, what to do in order to avoid uh, your joints from getting infection, some practical tips as well as some uh, evidence-based uh, information. So certain factors which are responsible for inf infection, we all know they may be related to the patient. Some of these are related to the indication as to why you're doing the surgery. Some of it is in the hand of the surgeon and is himself can control it. And some of it depends on the setup in which you're working. So I'm going to focus on a nursing home setup rather than on a, on a, a corporate setup where things are more or less institutionalized and more or less regular. Uh, I'm going to say that most of my talk is being taken from two articles. These are uh, the practical guidelines published by AOS in 2019 on preventing infection. And the study which even Pranav quoted, uh, the infection study, which was done in England and Wales and published in the Lancet again in last year. So quite a bit of what I'm going to talk is evidence-based and some of it is also based on eminence. Patient factors which are responsible for infection, this has been proven in the Lancet study, that males who have a high BMI, who are obese, who have a high risk as far as anesthesia is concerned, greater than three American Society of Anesthesiology risk scale, people who have liver disease, who have inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid or some such uh, are, uh, indication, people who are on chronic steroid use, diabetics, 
and people between the ages of 60 and 70 are more prone to infection. So less than 60 years of age and more than 80 years of age, the infection is seen to be lesser as compared to the people who are between 60 and 70. For some reason, these people are having a higher rate of infection. To look at the indication for surgery, post-traumatic arthritis has got a high rate of infection. Also, the implant which you use also matters. Suppose you're using a constrained condylar knee, the infection rate is really high. But this is probably not related to the implant, but related to your indication. You would use a constrained condylar in an indication which is uh, which will take in a surgery which will take longer time. Plus, it may be in a revision scenario. So, implant as far as uh, the length or longevity of the surgery matters. Then, if your surgery requires use of bone graft, especially in the tibia, the infection rates have been seen to be higher. So, these are the factors which are beyond your control and really you can't do much about it. You just have to live with it and try and minimize these complications or minimize these factors which will contribute to infection. So ideally when you select a patient, you should ensure because it's an elective surgery that the hemoglobin is optimized. You have a good glycemic control. The sugar should be anytime less than 200 milligram per deciliter. You should be adequately nourished. And for that, the albumin globulin ratio is an important indicator. Normally, in the ratio of 2 is to 1, a good albumin globulin ratio indicates that a person has got good immunity and his healing potential is good. Patients whom you should use a red flag or raise a red flag in your mind are the obese ones, people who have comorbid conditions, patients who are alcoholic, smokers, who have paralytic attacks, having a metastatic disease, or patients you are operating for some post-traumatic indication, you should red flag them and take special precautions which you would normally not do in a otherwise clean total knee replacement. So where do the bacteria for infection come from? If you know where the source of bacteria is, you can change your systems to eliminate these sources and reduce your infection rate. 90% of the time, the infection is from the patient himself. The patient's skin is the most, uh, most contaminated surface on which you work. Your airborne OT environment, people traveling inside and outside your OT, especially with devices like mobile phones or cameras, they do contribute as an indirect source of infection. Another important source of infection is direct contamination of your operating instruments, which happens if your systems are not correct. So what is the ideal preparation for skin? This is literature based, evidence based, ideally a patient pre-operatively, either the night before the surgery or in the morning, if you're operating in the afternoon, should have a good bath using a normal soap. You can use a medicated soap also, but a normal soap is good enough. But most importantly, that there should be application of chlorexidine, which is uh, as a brand name, you would know it as microshield, but chlorexidine application, say six to eight hours before the surgery is known to reduce the bacterial growth on the skin and prevent further growth of bacteria. So this works better than iodine-based preparation, what we normally use, betadine or povidone iodine. Chlorexidine is better because povidone iodine does not work in the long term. It works only in the short term. After six, eight hours of application of betadine, you might still get growth of bacteria, which is not the case when you're using chlorexidine. Shaving is not necessary. You, you should not use razors. Try and use a clipper just to minimize the hair on the surgical area. In a nursing home setup, in a small hospital setup, the autoclave, I feel, is the weak link in your entire chain of sterility. It is very important to realize that you use steam sterilizers where the temperature has to be above 120 degrees centigrade, and this temperature has to be maintained for more than 30 minutes. So 120 degrees C and 30 minutes, both of which should occur together. Commonly used indicators for sterility in our small nursing home setups is these strips. Now, once the strip turns black, it means your autoclave process is over. That is what the myth is. It's actually not correct because this strip will turn black the moment you achieve a temperature of 120 degrees. Even if you achieve it for half a second, the strip will still be black. So that itself does not indicate adequate sterilization. You should switch over to these new strips. What we use in our setup or in Cooper Hospital is the Sterigate strip by 3M. If you see the bottom most picture, it will show you an unused strip. 
where it has got a window which is initially white if you achieve the proper time and temperature only then will the entire window get converted into a black uh, marker and then your marker will go to the accept area and if it is either inadequate temperature or inadequate time it will come in the reject area so this is actually a strip you should start using in any setup or in every setup and once you start using it you will realize that you are you are really assured that your that your instruments are properly autoclaved it's a little expensive about 3 rupees per strip and you need to put ideally one strip in every ins instrument tray or instrument set which you use you should limit the number of people coming in your ot because the number of bacteria culture this has been proven by literature again higher the number of people the less more is the chance of bacterial contamination when you wash your hands or when you scrub up now with corona we all know how to scrub everybody knows how to wash their hands but you have to remember that soap and normal tap water is enough because you when you are washing your hands your aim is not to sterilize your hands. your aim is not to uh, uh, kill the bacteria on your hand but your aim is just to remove the dust and grime which you carry from outside into your theater so you need to wash under your nails up to your elbow you need to repeat it two or three times but this is not the end of the process after washing with soap and water you should dry your hand with a sterile towel and most important in, in decontamination or sterilization if you can say of your hand is use the alcohol based hand rub you have to use it for about 2 minutes and you may need to repeat it two or three times and you use it everywhere on your hand right from your fingertip to your elbow like you're washing up with soap after that you allow it to dry because your alcohol requires about 3 to 4 minutes to work on the bacteria and to denature the bacterial cell wall so you need to give it about a few minutes to dry and then you start your donning process so don't uh, wet don your hand should be absolutely dry even after using of sterilium don't touch the uh, gowns without drying your hands ideally in a total knee replacement you should use disposable gowns which should be breathable of adequate size various brands are available and i'm sure everybody uses it but in a small nursing home if you if you really need to use cloth as a gown try and avoid using it but if you have to use be sure that your gowns are not wet and do you use a plastic preferably sterile disposable gown under your uh, apron under your gown so that there is still a barrier between yourself and the sterile gown because once your gown becomes wet the sterility goes away so you should not use wet gowns and you should not allow splashes on yourself to make that gown unsterile you should always wear a double gloves normal uh, thickness gloves are enough you don't need orthopedic gloves orthopedic gloves do thicker they reduce the sensations of your fingers and wearing two orthopedic gloves is really impossible you can't function at all so two gloves normal size thickness is absolutely mandatory because a single glove has a higher rate of contamination almost 34% of single gloves get contaminated Uh, through your skin or through micro uh, punctures in the glove but if you use double gloves this reduces it to almost less than 5% also you have to remember that the gloves need to be changed on a regular basis i would recommend that you change it minimum 3 times number 1 after you finish your initial drapes just before you put your final o drape or u drape or whatever you use before that you change your gloves because during the draping process you might contaminate uh, the glove accidentally or knowingly then after every 60 to 90 minutes of surgery you should change your outer gloves and uh, wear a new pair of gloves on that we all know and we all change gloves before cementing but you should also remember to change your gloves after cement why is that because once you handle the cement with gloves the chemicals in the cement and the latex interact with each other causing the latex properties to change and make it more porous so even after cementing you should change your gloves we don't remember that but please keep that in mind i always use plastic drapes to isolate the patient hurts followed by cloth drapes which is a foundation drape then i change my gloves and wear a new pair of gloves and then over drape with your leg o drape or a u drape this is what i do routinely in all my patients whether space suits are essential whether they are absolutely mandatory there is evidence to say the space suits do not decrease the overall rate of infection 
so it is not mandatory to have space suits when you are doing uh, total knee replacement surgery it is good to have it but it is not mandatory it protects the you from the patient splashes rather than the patient from your uh, contamination so it works to protect you more than to protect the patient whether laminar air flow is is essential it is very good no doubt about it it filters maximum amount of particulate matter including most bacteria but important thing is if you have a laminar air flow you need to maintain it very very well maintenance of a laminar air flow is not cheap you have to change the epa filters every 6 months compulsorily plus it has to be decontaminated and flushed on a regular basis as uh, decided or as uh, scheduled by the manufacturer just having a laminar air flow and not maintaining it will actually cause a higher rate of infection rather than reducing it but overall if you look at literature laminar air flow or laminar theater has no effect on overall infection rate if you operate in a theater without laminar air flow the infection rate will be as equal as the one where you operated in a laminar air flow. so this is a kind of a summary of the evidence based information which i can give you a shower on the previous night with normal soap plus chlor exidin has got good evidence very operative antibiotic important to time it properly your first dose has to be 16 minutes before your incision and not just 5 or 10 minutes before because the time taken for the mic to be achieved in the blood is about 45 to 60 minutes and that time is essential to get peak concentration before you take your incision post operative antibiotics for 24 hours has got very good evidence to reduce infection rate beyond 24 hours iv antibiotics have been not shown to be very effective in reducing the overall infection rate in our setup we tend to continue for about 3 days and then give up but evidence does not support 3 days of antibiotics it just supports only 24 hours of antibiotic use in uh, skin preparation we all use betadine to paint but as evidence does not support use of betadine evidence supports the use of an alcohol based skin preparation you can use sterilium or what i use is cutacept which is an alcohol based solution if you read the cutacept instructions properly you have to you see that you applied once let it dry and then apply it for another coating and wait for 2 minutes for it to work if you follow this uh, properly the skin preparation will be adequate you should finish your surgery in the average expected time like for an uncomplicated tkr you should finish it within 16 60 to 90 minutes but if you go beyond that time the chances of infection are high so a time based surgery or a proper time based surgery will reduce your infection rate post op glycemic control i have already mentioned reduces your infection and use of tranexamic acid indirectly causes a reduction in infection because it reduces the formation of hematoma and thereby indirectly reduces infection there is very very poor evidence for some things which we do on a routine basis but there is no evidence which supports it number one is hair removal even if the even if the skin is hairy just clip it with a scissor or clippers and you need not shave it complete removal of hair does not reduce infections just keep that in mind intraop repeated dose of antibiotics may not help you but in our set of these and generally tend to repeat one antibiotic after about 3 hours or 2 hours so there is no evidence to support it use of a separate knife for skin you know people take incision with one knife and then throw it away there is no evidence to suggest that if you use the same knife in the deepest tissues your infection rate will increase no that is not the case ioban steroid drape or adhesive drapes do not reduce overall infection rate intraop antibiotic wash no difference in infection you already talked on space suits and laminar tape so what is the uh, evidence and certain recommendation which is eminence based my last slide Achad, last slide. slide very good yeah yeah thank you my perioperative antibiotics yes you have to use it good evidence only first and second generation cephalosporins are enough you don't need to go for meropenem or such higher antibiotics antibiotic cement there is limited evidence you can use it in selected high risk cases the red flags which we talked about in a routine case it is not absolutely mandatory pre operative nasal swab to detect mrsa again in high risk patients not necessary in 
routine people if you want to use an antiseptic wash you can use betadine lavage but it has to be diluted 1 is to 10 that is if you use 100 cc of betadine you use 900 cc of normal saline and this lavage has to stay in the wound for at least 2 or 3 minutes for the iodine to have an effect you can use that but again the reliability of the evidence is in doubt anticoagulant use increases infection rate is proven but anticoagulants are necessary to control dvt so you have to take that risk and go ahead you can't just stop anticoagulants in patients who are taking it for other indications drain no benefit in reducing infection check dress there is no recommendation whether you want to do or you don't want to do whether you do it within 24 hours or 48 hours is left to individual choice bilateral single stage surgery if you want to do is there evidence that it increases the infection rate no there is no evidence that bilateral single stage tki reduce increases infection and again use of infiltration or the pain cocktail which most people give does not increase infection in the patient thank you very much thank you harshad thank you that was very nice now from if your patient was to get infected despite all the precautions what to do for that we go on to abhishek narulkar on clinical symptoms and signs of uh good morning everyone yeah. uh, yes one second yeah so yeah abhishek is also practicing in the suburbs after having finished a stint at the academic hospitals over to you abhishek i'll stop sharing uh, so you can let, start yes yeah and please stick to time abhishek yes one sec uh, can you see my screen not yet no 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 not yet now not yet no not yet one second i stop and do it again yeah so just to summarize we are doing about 100000 tkrs in india annually and at 1% we are running about a thousand infections a year so that is the burden to our society and uh, harshad has brilliantly told us how to prevent our patients being at in that thousand but if they happen how to recognize them over to abhishek yeah is my screen visible now yes yes carry on please yeah yeah thank you so at the outset uh, i would thank mumbai suburban orthopedic society dr tushar jimulia and dr girish devnani to invite me to speak about uh, clinical features of infected tkr Uh, it was a nice uh, beginning by knowing what is the economic burden and what are the factors predisposing to infection in TKR. I'm going to talk about if the infection has already occurred, then how to diagnose, what are the clinical features that are associated with the infected TKR. So we already discussed this uh, that in primary joint replacement, the one to two percent of the TKs get infected. and revision 5 to 6% of the total knee arthroplasties but what is more important is the absolute count of the infected knee so as per us literature it has actually increased from around 8 to 10000 per year in the beginning of the decade or the beginning of the century to around 48 to 50000 which is almost a 6 to 7 times increase and this has happened even after the total a percentage of uh, infection in tkr reducing from approximately around 2% to 1% and if you see why we need to uh, clinically evol evaluate the patient thoroughly is because we have to find out uh, patients with subtle infections there will be few patients uh, which who will come to you with a discharging sinus or a pus discharging from the surgical side infection and once you see these patients at a glance you will understand that this is infection but not always uh, such you know you'll get such uh, patients with uh, infection uh, right right at your face most of the time the patients that come to you will come with subtle infection uh, there'll be erythema there'll be warmth there'll be reduction in the function of the joint and uh, it will be very difficult to label these patients whether they are infected or they are not infected 
it is even a challenge when you have operated your surgery uh, uh, the patient yours yourself and it is a nightmare for the patient and the relatives because you have probably shown them the moon they know that uh, their relatives have been operated with the tkr and they are doing well and it is very difficult to accept that my knee is not doing very well so the most important thing over here is you have to play safe avoid denial once you avoid denial and you consider that this particular patient may be suffering from a prosthetic joint infection then only will go and probe in more with your clinical acumen and try to find out whether this particular person is in patient is infected or not so what is the pji uh, the definition and the parameters will be taken up in the next lecture but i wanted to highlight a couple of slides about that because if you see as per the recent uh, literature in the journal of arthroplasty and the consensus by the musculoskeletal infection society and the infectious disease society of america you see that there's only one criteria that is based on the clinical parameters that is a sinus tract with evidence of communication to the joint or visualization of the processes so this is the only parameter that is clinical that is uh, that we are considering when we are giving the scoring system the other criteria are all lab based parameters and this is even more important that the sinus tract formation was only reported in 5% and in some cases around 10% of the patients with the infected tkr so 90 to 95% patients will not present with the sinus out of that around 65 to 70 percent patients will present with very mild symptoms and that is why unless you use your clinical acumen and suspect a prosthetic joint infection maybe you will delay the treatment and the patient outcomes will worsen all the other criteria are all serum and synovial based and sometimes they still may be non conclusive and you have to report if you have to wait for the intraoperative diagnosis but more important is high index of suspicion and trying to find out what is going on inside the joint when your patient is unhappy so why the stress of clinical findings unless you actually look for the prosthetic joint infection in quiescent stages you may miss it and you may may uh, you may wait on it and this may worsen the patient outcome and only if you suspect the prosthetic joint infection based on your history and evaluation of the symptoms and of course your clinical acumen then you will probe and find out what is going on you you try to prove whether it is infection or it is a aseptic kind of a, a problem so you have to look out certain parameters in your history uh, you have to look for recent or active bacteremia recent history of any procedures or surgeries any kind of a skin or epithelial tissue penetration so patient having iv drug use colonoscopy dental work any ulceration or any wound complication so all these patients will have high risk of uh, prosthetic joint infection and you should ask in the history about all these uh, any surgical procedures or any complications that have happened and as a rule every patient that presents with an unexplained painful total joint should be considered infected especially if the patient was doing well and after some time maybe a year or year and half down the line now patient is uh, complaining of decreased function then the prosthetic joint infection should be at the top of your list and you should always exclude it what do we need to ask to the patient as rightly mentioned uh, in the last uh, lecture these are all the conditions that predispose the patient to the infection so any prior infection diabetes smoking alcoholism obesity malnutrition steroid intake malignancy so all these parameters you have to actively ask when you are looking uh, at the patient with the infected tkr any bacteremic events like surgeries or any dental work should be noted on paper it is important to ascertain that the events around the time of initial surgery so you try to find out what has happened try to read through the surgical notes what was the operative time uh, anything that has happened before or after the surgery that may lead to uh infection post operatively has there been excessive wound drainage after the surgery any wound healing problems uh, any secondary suturing blood transfusion use of antibiotics for a additional period of time around the surgery so all these are red flag signs and when you see that this has happened maybe you should have a higher index of suspicion for 
uh, infection in a TKR. So uh, you have to fine tune your history by asking about the location. Sometimes the pain, the patient may get confused, and you should try to differentiate between the pathology which is inside the knee or maybe a referred pathology, referred pain. Again, the time of onset of the patient's pain is very important. Whether the patient has had a consistent pain and lack of function or the patient has had a good function in the past will also give you a clue about what is happening. Severity and the character of pain should be noted. Sometimes the patient, uh, sometimes the infection will uh, have a waxing and waning kind of a course. Maybe patient has had redness or edema in the past, but now it is settling down. So you need to probe in regarding whether there was any redness and erythema, any joint warmth in the, you know, in the previous interim period. And do, do they have any changes associated with the activity? This is important because any kind of a septic kind of a problem will have more involvement or more pain with the activity. Whereas uh, in infected joint, even there'll be pain during the rest. So you have to be inquisitive, try to figure out what is happening, uh, evaluate the patient as a whole and dig in more to, you know, so that you don't miss out salient or the subtle infections. So presentations are usually similar to what happens in other infections. However, we broadly dis dif uh, differentiate into a very red or acute knee or something that is more subtle. So in an acute knee, the patient will present with a persistent pain with stiffness at the site of arthroplasty. And it is associated with the infection in more than 90% of the patients. So in acute stages, there may be swelling, there may be tenderness, uh, wound drainage. So multiple other things that come, you know, delayed healing of the wound, uh, all these things, or maybe a discharge from the wound side. So all these things may be present in the acute. Whereas in chronic, usually the pain is more subtle. The function gradually deteriorates over time. The pain also worsens over the time. So in the physical examination, if you find a sinus tract which is communicating to the joint, then you don't have to think anything about anything else. This is definitely an infected knee. But sometimes you may get uh, warmth, redness, swelling. You also look for a low-grade fever which may be present, especially in hematogenous uh, spread cases. We'll come to that soon. You also look for range of movement, whether there is a progressive loss or there has never been, the, the patient has never gained the kind of range of movement that he should get after a total knee re replacement. In the history and examination, you can also briefly uh, try to find out the source of infection. We have already seen what are the sources. Majorly, the acute infections occur due to direct invasion or uh, a sinus tract formation or sometimes a wound dehiscence. So the skin bacteria colonize and uh, go inside the surgical site when there's a wound dehiscence. And in chronic cases, it is mainly about hematogenous infections. That is the infections that are coming from the uh, infective focals elsewhere in the body. This is important because the set of the disease, the clinical manifestations and the patient presentations are going to be different as a source of infection, the virulence of the organism changes. Okay. So basically, these uh, the clinical manifestations are going to depend upon few factors like the virulence of the organism. So, which is the organism causing the infection? Abhishek. Yes, sir. Abhishek, two more minutes. Yeah. Fine. So these are the uh, mode of initiation of infection, host immune response. So let me come to uh, clinical base features based on timeline. In short, they are classified into less than three more than three months to 12 months and more than 12 months. And I'll just briefly go through what is the difference. So in acute onset, the likely mode of entry is operative implantation and it is a rapidly deteriorating function. And the causative organisms are most mainly highly vir high virulence organisms like staph and gram negative bacilli. Clinical features, obviously cardinal signs of infection are present effusion, wound dehiscence, and drain is present. There may be superficial necrosis, cellulitis, and hematoma. And this condition should be managed fast without wasting too much of time. In delayed onset or the subacute, which is 3 to 12 months from the uh, primary TKR, the likely mode of entry again is operative implantation. However, the bacteria are 
not that virulent like Propneobacterium acnes or Staphylococcus, or it may be a polymicrobial infection. And the clinical features are sometimes uh, uh, very evident, like a sinus formation, or sometimes they may be very subtle, and you may be confused as to whether uh, this is infection or a, a septic pathology. What is more uh, important is if you have a hematogenous spread, then the chances of fever are more. Whereas in direct inoculation, the fever and the systemic uh, problems are lesser. In chronic situations, the, the spread is mainly hematogenous. So you should, you may find a source outside the knee, which is causing this particular problem. And the organisms are usually staph, beta hemolytic streptococci and gram negative bacilli. And you should always look for history of any other infection or trauma or any other bacteremia in the body because this spread is usually hematogenous. Clinical features, again, the cardinal signs of infection are present, but fever is more common in cases with the hematogenous uh, PJI or the chronic PJI as compared to the direct cases. So just two more slides. The point to remember in cases of dilemma. So if you have a dilemma, if you don't know what is going on, then you remember that patients with multiple findings consistent with uh, prosthetic joint infection will have a chance of uh, joint infection exceeding 20%. Presence of swelling and erythema around the knee arthroplasty is found significantly higher percentage of patients with infection than those in aseptic reasons. And uh, But unfortunately, there haven't been large or well-performed studies comparing the abilities of uh, different clinical findings. So clinical findings are for your acumen uh, and to suspect infection, but you cannot just label unless you got a sinus tract which is draining through the joint. And the most important thing is to stop denial, accept that this can be infected. And as a result, you know, you can probe in more. Uh, only I would like to see the silent salient feature of this slide. In acute infection, there's no biofilm formation, whereas in chronic infection, uh, there is biofilm formation. So you have the plan of management is going to be changing as you grow from acute to chronic. And that is why differentiation is more important based on the uh, clinical parameters. The take home message will be, although the current criteria for diagnosis is based on the lab parameters, you should have used your clinical acumen because unless you try to look in actively for it in majority of the cases, you may miss a prosthetic joint infection. Whenever there's a doubt, always consider it as a joint infection unless proven otherwise, because if you treat early, you'll get better outcomes. Have high, suspect, high index of suspicion in those with comorbidities that I just mentioned, or if there are telltale signs of intraoperative and perioperative factors that may increase the chance of uh, prosthetic joint infection. And beware of subtle infections, as often there may be denial on part of the operating clinicians, as also... Uh, on the part of the patients and the relatives to accept that this joint is inflamed or uh, infected. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. If you stop sharing your screen now. Yeah. So now that we have... So now that we have uh, got an idea of... Uh, the symptoms and signs over to Sanjay Londe for how to diagnose radiologically and microbiologically what is uh, the way to forward to co confirming your clinical suspicions. Over to you, Sanjay. Can you hear me, Sanjay? We can't hear you. Sanjay, please unmute. Sanjay, please unmute. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much, Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society and Dr. Devnani and Dr. Uh, Jumulia for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak in this uh, uh, sort of symposium on the infected knee. Uh, I think uh, whatever, whatever denial you may have, as you are going to operate more and more patients, 
we are going to have infected meals. As uh, I think my all my previous speakers have elicited, one percent of our patients are going to get infected, and the I think the crux of the matter is to catch them early so that you will be able to salvage the joint, and we will not land up in an unfortunate scenario of a chronic infection or maybe an amputation. I think uh, all the uh, sort of my previous speakers have elicited quite nicely the pathophysiology and uh, predisposing factors of the prosthetic joint infection and uh, the clinical signs and symptoms of that particular uh, uh, unfortunate event. So I think I'll just briefly run through uh, post-operative infection is a difficult complication. It is painful, disabling, costly, often requiring removal of both components and associated with a reported mortality of about 2.5%. Again, uh, as Dr. Harshad Argekar has said, advances in the understanding of patient selection, operating room environment, surgical technique, and prophylactic antibiotics two hours before and 24 hours post-op has dramatically reduced the infection rate from over 2 to 1%. Uh, higher incidence in immunocompromised patients and certain uh, metabolic syndrome patients like diabetes, rheumatoid disease, obesity, coagulopathy, patients on corticosteroids, Preoperative anemia. This is also is coming uh, fast emerging as one of the most uh, predisposing factors for periprosthetic joint infection and prolonged operative time and any previous knee surgery. These are the very nicely commonest organism is Staph aureus followed by coagulase negative Staphylococcus, then Streptococcus and sometimes very rarely in a very gross bad contamination or contamination from the urinary tract infection in acute hematogenous infection, gram-negative organisms like pseudomonas. So again, uh, this has been shown by Dr. Hargekar. It's either a direct contamination at the time of surgery, local spread of a superficial wound infection. In some unfortunate patients, hematogenous spread happens after some time, after the TKR, maybe a UTI or a upper respiratory tract infection, and reactivation of the latent knee infection. If the patient has had some high tibial osteotomy, or some previous surgery to that particular knee, and if you happen to operate that patient, then it may have recurrence of the infection. So I think these are the guidelines which all of we know, two hours before the surgery and 24 hours after the operation, prophylactic antibiotics. So coming to the classification, I think uh, as in medicine, if there is no clear cut solution, there are a lot of other classifications and a lot of criteria. So I will just briefly mention certain of the classifications. This is Sukhavayama classification. Early post-operative infection is the one which happens within the first one month. Late chronic infection, according to them, is more than one month and it's insidious onset. Acute hematogenous infection is that the patient is doing extremely well after your well-performed total knee replacement. And maybe after about one year or two year, uh, suddenly the range of motion goes down. I think oft repeatedly the people, the, my pre previous speakers have stressed on the point that a well-functioning joint suddenly becomes less functional, you know, and the most cardinal first important sign and symptom is to decrease the range of motion. Then you need to be very, very uh, sort of skeptical and you need to be, you need to have a very low threshold of, uh, for, for diagnosing the infection. Obviously, positive intraoperative cultures, uh, this is not uh, relevant mainly for the primary knee. But for the revision knee, you know, whenever you get send the cultures and they come positive, it should be treated as infection unless good otherwise. So this is the Sukayama classification. Diagnosis of early post-operative infection or acute hematogenous infection is not often difficult. As Abhishek has said, there is a local signs of uh, inflammation and infection like pallor, rubor, dolor, as well as there is a decrease in the range of motion. Late chronic infections are very difficult to diagnose, as, ha as has been said by Dr. Nerulkar, because it has only 15% of the cells and 85% of the cells are in the bio. 85% of the, uh, the, the, the cell cells are basically a biofilm. So it is very, very uh, subtle and insidious onset. So coming to the uh, another classification, this has been again said, early infection is up to two, three months, delayed infection up to three to 24 months, and late infection after 24 months. So I think uh, this has been again said by Abhishek, excessive wound drainage or post-operatively leaky wound. Uh, I think uh, in my practice, other uh, faculty members may disagree,
but if any wound is leaky after four or five days, uh, be it the hip or knee, I think in my practice, I consider it as infected unless proved otherwise. And I have very low threshold to go down and do a thorough debridement or give a good wash and maybe a change of plastic liner also. Uh, multiple episodes of wound erythema, if they are there, disproportionate pain is there, then you should have a very high suspicion of infection. Prolonged antibiotic treatment by the operating surgeon, it's a, it's a disaster because it may mask the infection. I completely agree with my previous speakers, though it is recommended that the antibiotics should be given for 24 hours. In my clinical practice, I give IV antibiotics for about uh, 48 hours and then stop the antibiotics to, to, to pick up the infection if it, if it happens. Now, lab reports. Uh, the, the only two very important lab reports which are shown to be uh, uh, very good markers of infection and have stood the test of time are ESR and CRP. As you know, I think uh, in Mumbai we cons or in India we consider 30 millimeters per e H uh, hour ESR as the normal, and CRP depending on which uh, machine you use and which method you use. You know, plasma separation or turbidimetry it might be five milligram per liter or 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, if you combine, there are a lot of papers. I did not actually. There are lots and lots of papers. If you combine the uh, both of them, ESR and CRP. Their combined sensitivity and specificity increases. So you have very less false positive and false negative sort of scenarios if you combine both these two markers. So I think uh, normal in, uh, in uh, if you, I think unfortunately, whatever literature we have till today is from Anglo-Saxon population, either from mainland Europe or from North America. And according to them, the ESR usually takes up to a year for normalization after a DKR. And CRP, according to those papers by Bob Dunsmoor and even uh, 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 one of the paper from the um, uh, professor, uh, I think uh, it, it is from the Leicester University, they say that uh, the CRP comes back to normal within six weeks after the primary implantation of the DTR. Unfortunately, there are no papers or there is no research about the... Uh, I think, can somebody mute? Uh, okay. Oh, uh, Kadi Madhi Taka Chi Shinga hai na? Don ke tin betli to ki unhi. Huh? Sure. Tepan de hai tila. Chik hai? Anne dupari ki tiwaas te hai na rai? Fortunately, there are no uh, reports uh, uh, of CRP level sort of uh, trends following simultaneous bilateral DKR in the literature. Uh, so actually, I want to share one of our research, uh, uh, if time permits, uh, uh, because there were no reports about the CRP trends in Indian population following a unilateral and bilateral simultaneous DKR. We, st uh, we sort of uh, studied this, uh, uh, this project uh, along with my colleague, Dr. Ravi Shah. Uh, and um, help from Amit Doshi, and uh, uh, we have recently published it in the in the Arthroplasty Journal. It's an open access journal, so when you are, if you are interested, you can access it. So actually, what we found, uh, we basically studied 50 of our patients, 25 unilateral and 25 bilateral, and uh, checked their CRP levels on the second post-operative day at eight weeks, 12 weeks, and 16 weeks. Now, as you can see, uh, in both groups, the CRP is rose on the second post-operative day. But interestingly, only in about 40% of the unilateral TKR patients, the CRP was normal at eight weeks after the operation. Whereas in almost 92% of the bilateral simultaneous TKR patients, it was still high at eight weeks. So if you are encountering a very uh, a high CRP at these particular time intervals in Indian population, I think you need not worry what you need to do is to repeat the CRP and it is the increasing or decreasing trend which is more important than the index value of the CRP. Obviously associated with other parameters and other diagnostic criteria. So in our patients at 12 weeks, almost 100% of our unilateral TKR patients, they achieved the normal CRP. Whereas by simultaneous bilateral TKR patients, it took almost 16 weeks for the CRP to come back to normal. So our conclusion was uh, these findings are significant as CRP is commonly used as a very sensitive indicator of post-operative joint infection. 
and we concluded that in Indian PKR patients, the CP values take longer time to return to normal than their Anglo-Saxon counterparts, and therefore published results regarding the normal levels of CRP in unilateral TKR and the normal results from the Anglo-Saxon uh, sort of research should not be extrapolated to the Indian TKR patients and to the simultaneous bilateral TKR patients. Uh, I know this will incite a lot of uh, questions, but what I am planning to say, it is not only the single level of CRP, but it is the trend. If you repeat the CRP, maybe after one or two days, and if it is still high or if it is rising, then obviously you are dealing with the infection. So I think uh, the ideal scenario for a diagnosis, as, as I think uh, my previous speakers have uh, said about the international, uh, international consensus on the di diagnosis of the infection, if there is an abnormal ESR, there is an abnormal CRP, and if you aspirate the knee joint and the cutoff level, according to the Parvezi and the latest guidelines, if, if you see more than 3,000 WBCs per ml in the knee aspirate, then definitely you are dealing with the infection. Uh, nuclear medicine studies, I believe the you know, Dr. Ahala Badia is going to talk about it, the newer tests, but they are not that useful because they lack good sensitivity and specificity. So what is the international consensus on the periprosthetic infection guidelines by American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons and a Parvezi group? Uh, definite diagnosis can be established either when there is a two positive periprosthetic cultures are there and they show the same organism. Then if there is a sinus tract which is communicating with the joint, then definitely you are dealing with the infection. But unfortunately or fortunately, only 5 to 10% of our patients, they uh, of the infected patients, they will develop a sinus tract. So we require the other minor criteria also. So if you have three of the other five minor criteria, like elevated CRP and ESR, elevated synovial fluid WBC count, uh, like more than 3,000 per um, ml, and change on leukocyte esterase test strip, if in the synovial fluid WBC sort of uh, um, uh, analysis, you need to ask your microbiologist to see how much percentage of the WBCs are neutrophils. If there is a neutrophil preponderance, that is, if the neutrophils or polymorpho neutrophils are more than 70%, then it, it, is, it is one of the minor criteria. Positive histological analysis. If you send a frozen section on table, and uh, if, uh, means, yeah, whenever I revise any knee, I have trained a couple of my uh, histopathologists to give me the frozen section report within five to 10 minutes. And again, the Parvezi group and the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons, their guidelines are very clear. If any frozen section sort of specimen shows more than five polymorphoneutrophils per high power field, then you are definitely dealing with the infection. And ideally, you should not be going in for a reimplantation or a second stage surgery. So, and a positive culture, obviously intraoperative. If three out of these five criteria are present, then also you are dealing with the infection. So first, let me reiterate, if there are two positive periprosthetic cultures showing the same organism, not those fancy organisms sometimes we see on the report like Acetobacter, uh, some uh, horrible names which you have never heard, which are skin commensals actually, or if there is a sinus tract, or out of these five, if you have three criteria, then you are dealing with the infection. So again, I think my previous speakers have spoke, uh, have referred to the same uh, white paper on this PJI uh, infection by AAOS group and Parvezi group. So I will just summarize, strong evidence supports the use of following to aid the preoperative diagnosis of prosthetic joint infection, namely ESR, CRP, and interleukin-6. There is a moderate strength of evidence to, uh, uh, to uh, of following markers like uh, peripheral blood huh? serum tumor necrotic factor alpha is also useless also there is a limited strength of evidence to support the use of the following especially pet scans and uh, that uh, uh, certain labeled scans again limited strength of evidence to support the clinical ability of the nuclear imaging so I think in a nutshell, very strong evidence support for CRP, ESR, and IL-6, moderate strength not to support the tumor necrotic alpha, and limited strength for all these imaging studies. Then, which is the another very good moderate strength of evidence supporting the clinical utility in diagnosing the PGI, 
synovial fluid leukocyte count, the figure to remember is more than 3000 per ml. Neutrophil preponderance or percentage figure to remember is more than 70% polymorpho neutrophils. Obviously, synovial fluid, aerobic and anaerobic cultures, if you get the organism and sensitivity, definitely you are dealing with the infection. Synovial fluid leukocyte hysterase test, which I believe uh, Dr. Halabadia will be elaborating on that. There is a moderate strength of evidence for leukocyte esterase test as well as alpha defense state test. Again, uh, certain laboratories, they may do a synovial fluid CRP, and if it is raised, again, you are dealing with the infection. Again, uh, uh, that particular group, they had a strong evidence of support for the use of histopathology to aid in the diagnosis of PGI. As I have told you, always a good idea to send a frozen section on table so that you get the report within five to 10 minutes. And if the pathologist reports to you that if there are more than five polymorphoneutrophils per high power field, you are dealing with the infection. The previous recommendation was more than 10 uh, polymorphoneutrophils, definite infection, five to 10 equivocal. But since then, the Parvezi group has revised that recommendation. And now they say, even if there are more than five polymorphoneutrophils per high power field, you are definitely dealing with the infection. So, Cultures of joint fluid and other fluid collections encountered along with the tissue culture from the superficial deep and periprosthetic layers are sent for analysis of the offending organism and antibiotic sensitivities. Acute hematogenous infection, it's slightly a different uh, sort of diagnosis. As, Sanjay. Yes. Yeah, please. One more minute. One more minute. Which uh, yeah. has been uh, covered by Abhishek. Again, the thing to remember is that a well-functioning joint immediately becomes very bad. The range of motion decreases. There is a local erythema, redness, and swelling. Again, the basic principles remain the same. C by C and ESR and uh, ESR and CRP in these particular patients are elevated. You may aspirate the joint to diagnose the infection and then uh, uh, then uh, then go forward for the management. I thank you for your attention and thank you the Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society. Good. Thank you. So, now that we realize how to diagnose the infection, we go to the things which are now we can expect in the near future on the newer diagnostic methods of infected TKR. Over to you, Vivek, for the same. Vivek is practicing in the Car Bandra area and is doing a lot of work on navigated knees. So, I'll stop sharing my screen, Vivek, and you can start now. Yeah, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you hear you? I, we just I, need to see your screen. Screen is not seen? No, we are seeing you. Oh, just a minute. Now? Yeah, now we can see your screen. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, Tushar, Girish, Mutha, and Dr. Ram Prabhu and Suburban Orthopedic to give me an opportunity to speak today. Uh, there is some fascinating new research coming out from USA with uh, Dr. Parvezi et al. And uh, I think that's the way forward for periprosthetic joint infection. So I just wanted to share certain things with you all. So PGI is one of the most unpleasant complications of total joint arthroplasty. Incidence stated is 0.5 to 2%, but incidence and prevalence is higher than believed. 12% of so-called aseptic could have periprosthetic joint infection. This is an article in CRR 2011. Management usually costly. Choice of treatment depends on timing of infection and fixation status of implants. It is associated with 4x increased odds of one year mortality compared to aseptic revision. Five year survivorship can be worse than some cancers. List of implant-related infective organisms that can fly under the radar is increasing. And this is increasing because now the diagnosis is getting better. Isolation of organism will get better over the next few years. So this has been spoken by the previous speakers, acute post-op less than four weeks, late chronic indolent infection after four weeks, acute hematogenous, and positive intraop cultures, uh, clinically unapparent infection with two or more positive intraoperative cultures. Diagnosis, there's no one gold standard method. I think you have to clinical examination, lab tests, 
biomarkers and certain newer things that i will be talking about so combined rmm bacterium of current test 50 to 93% sensitivity 82 to 97% specificity 80% accuracy problems in diagnosing and treating biofilm organism hides inside the cytoplasm of the cell can remain inactivated and when time comes can get reactivated this is just like uh, chicken pox no, in a child which can come up as shingles later the virus yeah. remains inactive and gets activated later cyanobacteria yeah. fluid cultures sensitivity 52% and specificity 95% such a coming negative should not give a false impression that there is no infection oh, hospital they will see there accommodation dr chopra please mute your please mute your screen jagmohan chopra mute yourself okay culture can be negative in up to 48% of these infections a uh, specimen taken should be taken with clean instrument and put in culture bottles directly never take the specimen put it on your assistant glove and then tell him to put it into the bottle put it directly into the sterile container specimen should not be lying around till you finish surgery send it to the lab immediately as soon as it's removed use blood culture bottles they give better results ask for smear culture aerobic anaerobic fungal and mycobacterium uh, diagnosis so serology yes are more than 30 crp more than 10 is suspicious definitely but variations exist according to age <laughs> medical core morbidities post operative period lab to lab different reports variation up to 30% esr and crp may normal crp may be normal in up to 18% of pgi cases aspiration very very important i routinely use it uh, my uh, and it's helped me in law it's bailed me out in a lot of times patient should be off antibiotics for 2 weeks no antibiotics unless diagnosis reached or refuted sometimes we can't keep the patient off antibiotic for 2 weeks when we do a dare procedure because you know there is a golden period and if you keep waiting the dare uh, success rate may go down blood culture if patient has fever then we can send blood culture sometimes if you're lucky you may get bacteria identified through that so musculoskeletal infection society keeps changing their criteria and they have revised them recently i think 2 years back this improves clinical diagnosis early effective management streamless research efforts standardization of algorithms across all institutes investigating pgi they designed a uniform criteria two major criteria sinus tract communicating with processes or processes is seen through the wound a pathogen is isolated by culture from two separate tissue of fluid sample obtained from the affected processing joint minor criteria elevated esr and crp increased synovial wbc count or leukocyte esterase positive increased synovial polymorphonucleoside positive histological analysis on periprosthetic tissue single positive culture pgi may be present even if less than four of these minor criteria are met uh, along with esr and crp now d dimer is being done routinely at most centers and it's uh, helping a lot so this is an app which has been devised by the americans uh, i think parvez is leading the research on this i suggest everybody doing joint replacement and dealing with infection should download it it's available for android and ios and it gives you papers of the week recent research documents so there are a lot of documents on infection and if you search you get a list and a summary of all those documents they have also added criteria for a dare suppose you want to do a dare procedure or you want to Vivek. two stage yeah, yeah. Wait two more minutes. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> if you want to do a day procedure, they ask you a lot of questions, put in input of your patient's history and tests, and you get a percentage of success. If the percentage of success is less, is better to go for two stage revision. Histology is operator dependent. You need musculoskeletal pathologies, beware of fractures and inflammatory arthropathies. Bone scans not useful. Leukocyte esterase used in America. Alpha disinfectin used more in Europe. uh il6 is also helpful pathogen isolation and culture negative case sonification of implant should be done longer culture times if necessary multiplex pcr next generation sequencing 
so there are database of more than 40000 species of organism including bacteria fungi in their database and through the synovial fluid they try and isolate the rna and the dna and match it with their database this can grow organisms in 90% of culture negative specimen and it can also give you a, a more number of bacteria in fact what they feel now is that you may be targeting one organism but it may be a multi bacillary infection in most cases they have sometimes with this technique uh, found up to uh, more up to six organisms and sometimes they have to use two or three different antibiotics to cover all of them and after doing this the success rate of their second stage revision has gone up significantly so these publications will be coming out uh, very soon but i think this is the future and i hope it comes all over the world soon uh basically not isolating an organism increases the headache of the surgeon and the microbiologist and we do not know what we are dealing with and recently in a few cases i have seen mixed fungal and bacterial infection in diabetics who are immunocompromised so next generation sequencing can isolate everything and uh, i think this is the future please try and use the app it is really helpful as the covid goes down and the case cases start coming in i'm going to be using it and uh, i think artificial intelligence will help us at least more than what we are doing just now thank you very much thank you vivek if you stop sharing your screen yeah. i'll go to my screen now so that was what to expect in the future but now over to girish because he's going to talk to us what to do now the meat of the talk start the actual surgical management and i would like to personally thank girish for attending and co-hosting the seminar with me today despite undergoing a family tragedy less than 72 hours ago so girish this is you got to tell it as acute status of infection i will stop sharing sharing my screen and you can start now okay can you all see this yeah you are on okay let me just go to slide show so now as tushar very rightly said we are at the business end of the problem and we have to catch the beast by the horns we have diagnosed the tkr has got an issue we have done everything we can to prevent it from happening we know it's bad for you me and everybody but at the end of the day if you have a problem like this staring you in the face there are only two options either have take your tail between your legs and run or face it boldly uh, with all knowledge at your disposal which we have had a lovely session so far with all talks contributing to that so my remit today is to speak on the acute infected tkr and in every tkr the treatment goals are very similar to deliver a pain free joint which is achieved by eliminating uh, the infection the treatment plan has to be customized and is also dependent on the type of microorganism responsible goal of each surgical strategy which we'll be discussing from here on will be to remove all infected tissue and hardware or to decrease the burden of the biofilm as we call it in case any prosthetic material is retained such that the post operative antimicrobial treatment can eradicate the remaining infection now this is been discussed by dr londe and dr alabadia but uh, this is the susama susama what about classification as it really it should be where type 2 and type 3 come under the category of the acute post acute infected knee replacement i e the early post operative infections uh, which are within the first 4 weeks of diagnosis or the acute hematogenous infections which occur in a previously well functioning joint and may be associated with a segment with a suspected bacteremia again less than 3 to 4 weeks in duration so we are very clear that the type 2 and type 3 are what we are referring to here in as an acute infected tkr macpherson also gave a staging system for pgi taking into account factors such as the uh, systemic host factors which alluded to very well by dr argekar of age alcoholism chronic indwelling catheter chronic malnutrition diabetes etc and certain local factors also contributing to the staging system of the pgi we don't use this system so frequently but it does have a lot of merit in just going through it so the treatment algorithm the acute pgi is what i have circled 
The rest is going to be discussed in subsequent talks by our overseas faculty and Dr. Solangi and Tushar himself. So acute PGI basically alludes to where we are dealing with good bone and soft tissues. We are having a stable prosthesis and we do not have what is called DTT or difficult to treat infections caused by pathogens resistant to biofilm active microbials, which of course we will know only as a secondary part once the cultures have been received. This is another uh, table highlighting the, the difference between acute and chronic PGI, basically alluding to the presence or absence of a immature or mature biofilm. And the perioperative time is less than four weeks after surgery or less than three weeks of symptom, as I said, in type two and type three. Acute features have been highlighted by Abhishek. Acute pain, fever, etc., are pretty obvious that will uh, help you to reach a diagnosis and treatment patterns is debridement and retention of prosthesis, changing of the mobile parts. So these are a few pictures which you will encounter, no brainer as yes, we need to go in. So, uh, clips in, red inflamed joint, a nightmare for you, nightmare for the patient and for the relatives, or sometimes presenting late with uh, symptoms coming in, in a previously well-functioning TKR with sudden onset of uh, effusion and redness in the area and a, and a distant focus of infection, which is probably well documented. Uh, so the international consensus on orthopedic infections was uh, re recommend was first formulating their guidelines in 2018, wherein they described the DARE as a debridement, antibiotics and irrigation with retention of implants. So this is going to be henceforth referred to my talk as DARE. I'm not going to say the whole description again. And it has got the two indications we mentioned. Uh, the strict contraindications are if there's a chronicity of the infection, then the DARE is not to be done and it's just a hogwash. So stick to the indications for some degree of success and how much we'll just see in a minute. Relative contraindications also uh, are if you have a very highly virulent organism, then you can pretty sure say that this is not going to be the final outcome. And other factors which preclude to uh, surgery uh, being successful in the DARE scenario is advanced age and inflammatory arthritis along with chronic uh, renal disease. So some papers which will highlight to us what uh, we were talking about before we go on to the actual procedure. So this is one major paper which I will quote subsequently as well uh, in 2019. Uh, the most important thing from this paper is that it is a safe, effective and without a negative functional impact. This paper had a mean follow-up of 42 months with an 89% overall success rate. And this paper clearly indicates that you have to adopt a low threshold for assuming infection and subsequent dare can be done without the fear of compromising final functional impact. So this is what Abhishek said about self-denial. I'll take it one step further. Please do not be an ostrich and bury your head in the sand. How can my case get infected? That's a question which each and everybody of us has encountered. And if we haven't encountered, then, tell, then let me tell you, either you are lying or you're not operating enough. And uh, so please don't be an ostrich. Face the bull by the horns and take it to its natural conclusion. Continuing with the Barras paper, group are persisting wound discharge with a CRP rising after the first 72 hours, persisting wound discharge at day 10, irrespective of CRP. And third is strong clinical suspicions such as significant wound healing disturbances like a superficial wound infection, superficial wound dehiscence or skin necrosis, which we all tend to gloss over. No, no, it'll settle down. It's not a problem. It's just superficial uh, problem. So that is what I mean by facing the bull by the horns. Don't be an ostrich. Uh, we have to always try and use anti-biofilm, antibiotic combinations using Refamp and Ciprofloxacin. Uh, Two-year minimal follow-up in, in this paper, uh, wherein the patient should be considered cured only if they have no symptoms of infection and progressively improving markers after stopping antibiotics, while a failure is considered a chronic infection or a need for a second sur secondary surgery. <clears throat> this is something which uh, has been recently pushed in a couple of uh, years that you need to have a dual surgical setup 
which will and that has been shown to improve the infection control of the dare procedures uh, dual dare setup which is establishing a new sterile field after the initial debridement of what we call the ind and this uh, separately cause uh, decrease in the risk of infection recurrence on a multivariate regressive anal analysis and this has now been adopted by even the international consensus group comprising of javed parvezi and tom uh, thorsten gurke et al so what do i do and what what do i feel is the best approach for there as a it's an extensile approach exposure you should have the entire femoral and tibial components uh, visualized first debride superficial compartment then aspirate the knee before the formal arthrotomy the arthrotomy needs to be either a conventional one or extending uh, the using extensile approaches in case the knee is a bit stiff or tight it is mandatory to do a complete anterior medial and lateral synovectomy followed by the removal of the polyethylene insert before we do a posterior synovectomy at this stage the implant stability is checked uh the the mantra in a successful dare is treated like a tumor it is not a tumor but in some ways it is the pgi surgery has to equate tumor resection because only and only if you have that mindset will you do aggressive debridement and hope for an improvement in results at the end of the day the biofilm has to be tackled aggressively we do all know that we need to use irrigation with pulse lavage and the best solutions recommended have been saline with betadine 6 to 9 liters recommendation by all uh, literatures we shift then to a sterile setup which i will just explain to you how it goes about and the, after that the joint is re irrigated and uh, poly insert is re inserted and the negative suction drains are used in these cases to sure you must uh, debate on this after we finish uh, if we, there is time we need we do need to continue with iv antibiotics for a long period of time uh, between 4 to 6 weeks again that will be something we will be discussed at the end of the entire session so this is what i mean uh, two type of setups have to be ready in your ot one is the clean setup which will come into place once the dirty setup has been utilized for the initial debrima and synovectomy after the joint is thoroughly irrigated biofilm eradicated a reprep is done of the uh, wound area and the second uh, part of the surgery is then commenced how do we do it we will just see in a few few minutes so now let me see if this hole hopefully yeah, yeah so the approach is pretty much using the same earlier incision and uh, it sometimes has to be a little longer but we have to excise any sinus if it shows up by that time then we are remember we are sticking to the first four weeks here of either presentation of symptoms or five, four weeks in the initial post op period so this is only because we have a friendly neighborhood family physicians who will just bungle bund uh, will wait till they come send them to us by giving them some antibiotics <laughs> Uh, uh, first uh, superficial debridement the joint is aspirated to before the formal arthrotomy is done and then the second stage is the formal medial parapetalar arthrotomy which has been done earlier i would not recommend any of you to try a subvastus approach uh, in infected knees open and see and eradicate the uh, necrotic tissue sometimes this has to be extended using a tibial tubercular osteotomy approach if it's a very tight knee or sometimes a quadriceps snip as well then the next part is the synovectomy the synovectomy is probably the most important part of this procedure a uh, thorough synovectomy has to be performed sorry uh, has to be performed taking into account all the soft tissues from both the uh, medial and the lateral gutters uh, after that the specimens are sent for culture and the synovial tissue uh, and the tissues have been to be sent in a specific technique so that there is no contamination minimal exposure of the sample after collection and as vivek very clearly said it has to be sent to the lab at the earliest to prevent cross contamination the synovectomy is the single most uh, important step which decides how much of the debrima is going to succeed and eradicating the soft tissues soft tissue uh, components sorry uh moving forward uh you see yeah the next stage is removal of the polyethylene 
and uh, that is going to give access to the posterior sorry access to the posterior synovium and will allow us to clear up the uh, posterior column posterior gutters as well uh, after that we have to decide about whether our implant is stable or not and that is a very crucial thing because before you proceed to the next step you have to make sure that the implant stability is not in doubt if at all there is a break in the cement mantle and there is some degree of loosening then it should be addressed with a two stage procedure this is more important when we are doing it for acute hematogenous spread then the next thing is to tackle the biofilm now the biofilm has to be very aggressively eradicated in the way it's been recommended in the way we do it is using a sponge soaked in betadine and uh, uh, saline to clear all the metal surfaces including the top of the tibial tray from which the polyethylene has been excised uh, a lamina spreader sometimes is used to access the posterior aspect of the joint including the metallic uh, areas of the posterior femur and the posterior tibia irrigation then is commenced the common solution recommended and used is a mixture of saline and betadine uh, six to nine liters as i said is recommended in literature and it should be used uh, in conjunction with uh, a pulse lavage system without the pulse lavage it is not considered an adequate uh, irrigation uh, using hydroxin peroxide or sodium hypochlorite or any other such solution or chlorhexidine does not have the same degree of success and literature on the whole does not recommend them but betadine and saline are the most uh, reviewed in literature with best results then we move on to what is called a second stage setup uh, the trial poly has been inserted after the initial debridement and uh, the wound is then covered with a betadine swab and a sterile and a sterile iodine drip is applied the whole system, the whole team then rescrubs the whole extremity is uh, undraped and redraped again and the new setup uh, sterile setup has is now come into the picture the wound is reprepped as you would for a fresh uh, surgery and uh, re repeat irrigation is then up, uh, done after that the we'll then come to the final poly insertion in a minute so final irrigation prior to setting up the initial fi final poly So the final poly being inserted after we are sure that the irrigation and the re repeat irrigation also is satisfactory the joint is then tested for stability uh, remember we may have to go up a size of the polyethylene thickness compared to the initial joint and you should be prepared for it hence the need to know which joint we are using uh, final closure is uh, recommended to use a monofilament uh, suture to prevent the infection and we then we use it over a negative suction drain now how much does the dare really help us the overall success rate is in excess of 50% but depends on huge amount on patient selection as vivek said you have these apps and this is one such a picture of an app which will tell you how to score the patient to see whether the dare is going to be helpful or not uh, taken from the apps that have been devised by dr parvezi and his group so some studies to show whether the dare really helps and how it has held on in literature as still a abiding procedure 1990 study by uh, shofford and morris uh, saying a 77% uh, successful rate but they had a higher risk of uh, recurrence of infection because at those times the antibiotics were not exactly as good as we have them today uh, in the journal of arthroplasty 1997 24 infected tkrs with 22 patients 100% success rate in the immediate post op group while the 70% success rate in the hematogenous group again it all depended on how much the surgery was performed as per the time profile discussed another paper uh, from the chinese can you give us a quick summary yeah 12 1200 cases again two criteria that were determined were time from symptom to debridement and non mrsa species while minor criteria were open debridement and liner exchange with comorbidities 
another paper which says that DARE is helpful more in acute post-op than hematogenous. And the last paper which I was saying was even if you do a failed DARE, there is no compromise to success of subsequent stage revision. This is something we kept in mind. So please be aggressive in your DARE. The difference between something good and something great is purely attention to detail. And finally, that I admit the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. Thank you very much. So, GD, if you stop sharing your screen, that was a very nice how to deal with the acute infection. And I can start sharing my screen. Uh, now, we come to the first of the two guest lectures. And it's my privilege to ask Mukesh Emadi to give us his perce perception of a single stage revision of the diagnosed infected TKR. Mukesh is a senior consultant orthopedic surgeon in Wrightington, having trained originally in Mumbai and then in Oswestry. Wrightington is known to all joint replacement surgeons, thanks to John Chanley. He currently is examiner for FRCS Orth and is a surgical tutor for the Royal College of Surgeons of England and also runs an arthroplasty fellowship if anybody is interested. So over to you, Mukesh. I'll stop sharing my screen. We can't hear you, Mukesh. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. I can see you. You need to start sharing your screen now. Thanks. Thanks for waking up early and joining us at 4 a.m. UK time on a Sunday. Just a second. The technical. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can you see the presentation? Now the title slide, Sushar? No, I can see you. I can see you. Can you? I've I got the title. Study. I can see your study and you, but not you. Okay, that's not fine. The screen. Not okay. the screen. So you need to share screen at the. Let's zoom. Yeah. On your on your Zoom, there'll be a green button. Share screen in the bottom middle. On the Zoom. Is yeah, your, is your, yeah, but is your that. talk open? Is your talk open? Because we are not seeing it. Uh, Have you opened your talk? What is that? Is your PowerPoint open? Yeah. Yeah, it is open now. Can yeah, we now see? we can see it. Yeah, yeah now okay, we can see thank it. you. Yeah. I got tech support here anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, good, good, uh, good morning. Uh, in fact, it's good afternoon uh, to you all in India. It's, as you can see, it's very dark and we're in the middle of winter. First and foremost, thank you, Tushar, for inviting me to speak here on this uh, esteemed forum and also to Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Tushar has introduced, uh, I'm an alumnus of KM and uh, I have an affinity for Mumbai and Mumbaikers. I work at uh, Wrightington Hospital, which, as you know, is the home of arthroplasty, and I've been a consultant for about uh, 16 years. Uh, okay, just a second. Okay. We are situated uh, in the northwest of England, between Liverpool and uh, Manchester, and... Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Professor Robleski, who was Sir John Charlie's successor, and Kevin Hardinge of the Hardinge Approach, who also worked at his hospital. This was me when I had a bit more hair, really. And uh, just to give an overview of what we do, uh, we do nearly 4,000 joint replacements every year. And in terms of uh, knee revision, we did about 500 uh, knee revisions in the last three years. So. We do the largest number of arthroplasty in the country. So the great man said it's the saddest of all complications. And as you know, he devoted his life to reduce infection from 8% when he started to less than 1% with the use of laminar flow, exhaust suits, and IV antibiotics. And uh, the MRC study is excellent in that, although some people are challenging it. I don't think there's any merit in that. As arthroplasty surgeons, we will be faced with this time and again. As uh, GD said, if you don't see this, that means you're not doing enough. So the thing is, how do we investigate and treat this? I think the uh, previous speakers have eloquently uh, said about the investigation and treatment. I'll just briefly touch upon it. Uh, I would urge you to read this document on the BOA website. It's a joint document between the BOA and BASC. And uh, it gives some guidelines about management. I know there are so many guidelines and protocols everywhere. We are becoming slowly protocol monkeys rather than using our brains. 
So briefly alluding to, Vivek already spoke about this, but a uh, few things. Uh, uh, X-rays imaging, nuclear imaging may be useful with a negative predicted value. Avoid antibiotics for two weeks. We use blood culture bottles and extended cultures. And uh, five separate samples, I know speaking to Dusha, this can be quite difficult. If you start checking out five nibblers, I don't think the hospital will be very pleased with you. So I think this is a practical problem in Mumbai. And we always discuss all the patients for revision in our MDT. So we have the microbiologist, the radiologist, and we have some senior brains, Professor K, Professor Porter, and we pick their brains. And Rob Nelson, the microbiologist, is excellent. He'll tell us what antibiotic to put in the cement, what systemic uh, antibiotics to give, and for how long. I think MDT is a must when you're doing such complex work. So you've debrided, uh, done everything. It looks like this now. So what next? Are you going to do a single stage or are you going to do two stage? So the four factors that will determine that is the host, the organism, the soft tissues, and the bone, and the bony defects. I'll come to that in a minute. Let's do a bit of literature search. I think this man leads a lot of credit, Professor Robleski. Uh, in the early 90s, he had the guts to uh, consider doing a single stage revision for hip replacement with a discharging sinus. Nobody would even think of doing a single stage revision in those days, but he did, and he published his work in the JBGS, which was written by uh, Videsh Rauth, who is again a Mumbaiker. And uh, he said 86% good results obtained with hips with a discharging sinus. This was a seminal work. And this led other surgeons to uh, think about uh, doing a single stage. Writington has always led the way in this, like hip replacement was by Charlie and the other joints were then replaced. Similarly, single stage was started by Robleski and then Endoclinic came on board, and I think this is a seminal paper as well. If you see the first line here, only in the presence of a positive culture and uh, uh, antibiotic sensitivity would they consider a single stage revision. If they don't have these two things, they'll do a two stage procedure. However, a recent systematic review and meta analysis by Ashley Blom's group in Bristol, which is part of the INFORM study, which looks at the 3 million joint replacements on the NJR. I said that the reinfection rate between first and second stage is not great really, it's just marginal. If you see it's 7.6% reinfection with uh, and 8.8%, so it's marginal. And in fact, two stage revision does poorly in this case. Let's give a background of our practice in UK. I'll be giving the Wrightington perspective. So nearly one in four revisions of knee replacement in the UK are for infection. And unfortunately, oh, we might have all these things by Javed Parvizi about uh, uh, the criteria, but there's no gold standard for diagnosing infection. I still feel our clinical acumen is very, very important. If in doubt, it's infected. So let's look at the NGR data. If you look at this column here, the row here, we have infection, 255 revisions, 6% one stage, 83% two stage. However, only 81% went on to have the second stage. So there was a 2% dropout rate. If you see this one, you have 5% one stage and 91% uh, first stage of the second stage, but there's a dropout rate of about 5%. This is very important. When we read about the results of two stage procedures, uh, only those patients who have gone to the second stage are included. If they stop at one stage, those patients are excluded. So you have to be very careful in how you interpret the results. Whilst one stage revisions, all patients are included. So while statistics is important, it's like a bikini. What it reveals is suggestive, but what it conceals is vital. So you've got to read between the lines and analyze the data properly. So let's come to the basic science of infection in the presence of a foreign body. So we have the principles of musculoskeletal infection, the immunology, and what is our aim? Is it eradication of infection, reimplanting a new joint, reducing morbidity and mortality, improving quality of life, and also the health economics? We should not forget that these are mainly older patients in, in the West, they live on their own, and we have to look at their independence as well. 
we cannot clear infection in the presence of foreign material. We have the elegant paper by Gristina and Kalkin looking at surface phenomena with dead spaces. Infection leads to elevation of CRP and ESR, which is a measure of a patient's immune response. And I'll be worried if this is not elevated, that means the patient is not mounting an immune response, uh, which happens in rheumatoids on anti-TNF drugs. And the immunological proteins produced are aimed at specifically the infecting organism. So we have to remove the infected tissue. It's like any treatment of open fracture, really. Take, take out the foreign material, uh, close the dead space, provide stability, identify the organism, and institute microbial therapy. So one stage achieves all of these objectives, if you see. We take out the implant, we do a synovectomy, we do a thorough debridement, dead space is filled with new cemented prosthesis containing antibiotics locally, the implant is fixed to bone, so it provides stability, and restoration of articulation will improve the soft tissue function as well. So what is the end point? Is it just eradication of infection or is it uh, improving the function as well? As I said before, two-stage exchange looks at the success rate of patients who have had both stages, whilst one stage will look at all the patients who had surgery. So little difference uh, reported between the single and two-stage procedures. Uh, whilst two-stage procedure has been attributed to a lot of success uh, by Reg Elson from Sheffield, but he also says that it has to be read uh, quite uh, minutely. Eradication of infection, whilst it's important, it's not the only aim of the procedure. We all know that it's a major operation. It's like a shark attack under controlled conditions. No point in just having fries, yeah? You need a burger to fill you up. So the amount of stuff that's used here is considerable. Uh, the cement spaces can be massive and these lead to fractures, ebonation of bone, and sometimes you have a periprosthetic fractures as well with this and it can be quite disabling. To get some stability, sometimes we use a Kunschner nail across the joint, which gives a lot of stability, but you can imagine an you know, eight-year-old with this uh, spacer in place with a stiff knee, life's not fun. The mobility and mortality of two stages also to be considered. A lot of these elderly patients will never come to the second stage because they'll not be able to tolerate. There are a lot of comorbidities. The anesthetists won't pass them fit for such major surgery. The same group from Bristol looked at the psychological aspects of uh, uh, infection and revision surgery. Clearly, in two stage, there were physical limitations, psychological uh, impairment, and also uh, the use of antibiotics caused a lot of side effects. So quality of life between two stages is not very good. They may be advised bed rest on crutches and sometimes moderate mobilization may be detrimental and may cause fracture or displacement of the cement spacer. Once I had used an articulated spacer and there was subluxation of that and patient had to go back to theater. So it's not easy. Now, coming to the surgical aspects, a uh, lot of the previous speakers spoke about the biofilm, even GD spoke about it, and uh, we got to get rid of the biofilm. It's a bad thing. So we have to have extensive debridement, take out all the devitalized tissue, prosthesis, all cement, and then evaluate the soft tissues and bone stock and assess your reconstructive uh, options. I'm sure you have a fair idea when you started uh, because you would have done the pre-operative planning. But as surgeons, we know that when we go inside, things can change quite quickly. So we need these four factors to make a decision, as I said before. In the past, we used to use antibiotics in cement using from the vial and the nurse would mix it for us. But fortunately now we have, I don't know if it's available in India, we've got uh, this palacos, which has got vancomycin. And yes, it is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we use that on a regular basis now. And we also have Wang Genis, which is a cement from Italy, which is low viscosity if you're interested in that. And uh, so antibiotic options, systemic and local. Why do we need local antibiotics? Because it reduces the so toxicity and also the local availability is 
much, much higher and it decreases bacterial adherence. So these are some of the factors I'll just, uh, I won't go into the detail of that, but uh, you know, this is some experiments we did and the material has to be porous and rough and it improves the antibiotic illusion. So local antibiotics in bone cement are extremely important. And subsequently we gave about four to six weeks of uh, systemic antibiotics as recommended by the microbiologist. So this is our series. We just had a snapshot of, uh, we did an audit in uh, 2014. So in that year we did 189 revisions of which 50 were culture positive and uh, we say if it's more than 50%, more than three samples are positive, only then it's conclusive evidence of infection. So we had 21 of those cases. And as you can see, out of 189, we did only two, uh, 15 two-stage procedures. The majority of them were uh, single-stage procedures. By far, coagulase negative strep is the most common organism. And skin edge, as Kevin Hardin used to tell me, is tiger country, protect it. Just uh, put a swab or something and don't let it come into the main wound. Ask your assistant not to put his hands inside the wound. Use instruments. If anything touches to the skin, don't let it inside. If I take stray sutures, I take it out and put a new suture when I'm closing. This is the group that is difficult to treat, the urinary tract organisms, very, very difficult to get rid of. So if the patients can be treated for urinary tract infection prior to operation, it's much, much better. Uh, aspiration is good. It's very specific, nearly 99% specificity, but it's rubbish in terms of sensitivity, really, only 23%. But we aspirate in a clean air environment, make a small incision. So when the needle goes through the skin, it doesn't take the uh, contaminants and it's done in a clean air enclosure and send it in blood culture bottles. So in our audit, we found 11% of revision were for infection, which is less than the national figure, but we get patients from everywhere. So our infection rate is less than 0.5% following uh, TKR. And joint uh, aspiration is important. It's very, very specific. And more major organism is CNS. Some examples, illustrative examples. These are all my patients. You can see the osteolysis under the tray, a late infection after 15 years. Uh, I think original was done by Professor Ubreski. And this is a post-op and uh, she's doing well after seven years, uh, single stage revision. This one, again, late infection after eight years, uh, slightly immunocompromised, uh, but quite recent patient. So I've been using a sleeve and uh, two years looking all right. This is combination of wear and uh, residual infection. Yeah, post-op x-ray and seven years looking good. This is another case, uh, he had prostate cancer. This developed after a dental procedure. And uh, again, thorough debridement, synovectomy, single stage, and uh, five years was looking good, but unfortunately he passed away because of his cancer. This is another example, thorough debridement, and uh, this is nine years. This is my, probably my longest, nine to 10 years is my longest follow-up, I think. Others have all died, actually. Uh, this is an interesting case. This is a cautionary tale, actually. This lady, a 72-year-old lady, ex-superintendent of nursing, had this knee. She said she, it never felt right, and uh, she's always been complaining. 10 years, she carried on. And uh, we investigated everything. We drew a blank, but... If you look at the leukoscan, scan, it did light up in that area. So I was wondering whether this is infection. As orthopedic surgeons, we know when in doubt, it's infection. So, but I was surprised when I opened up, this is what I found. So there was extensive metallosis. The whole thing was black, like in a resurfacing, really, resurfacing of the hip. And this is actually because the implant used was uh, an implant, a tibial tray with the inbuilt 15 degree posterior slope. So it had worn through the poly and also through the titanium base plate. And the poor lady, this was happening for so many years. Had it been addressed before, probably the poly could have been changed, but now she had a, a difficult operation, really. So in conclusion, Chairman, I think these are what uh, are my conclusion. One stage revision in knees is a logical option for the reasons I've said. If it fails, you can always do a second stage. 
Knowing the organism and the antibiotic sensitivity is extremely useful. And I think it's a procedure of choice in old patients with comorbidities. If you are all thinking of uh, doing neurogen knee surgery, it can be quite lonely. It doesn't do as well as hip replacement revisions because too much metal in a superficial joint, soft tissue problems, in reinfection, etc. So you should hunt in a pack, form a network, or at least have a buddy. When you do operations, have a buddy with you. Here, dual surgeon operating is becoming the norm now. Two surgeons do major operations. You can bounce off ideas. And also you can share the pain because it is not a good surgery, I can tell you from experience. And set up an MDT if that's possible. It's a philosophy, the one stage revision, but I think at present the science and the emerging evidence is quite compelling. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mukesh. That was lovely. Also, I hope I stuck to time, Tushar. <laughs> yes, yes. I never stopped you. And thanks for sharing your personal experience as well. So if you stop sharing your screen, I can start sharing mine. So I hope uh, everybody can see me. I'll try to stick to my time and topic on the two-stage revision for infected TKR. Uh, we all have gone through this basic of assessment, mm -hmm. bloods, imaging, aspiration, biopsy. Not much has been talked about biopsy, but one must be aware that a uh, two-stage revision may not be the end all. Multiple surgical procedures may be required, plus prolonged use of antibiotics. And this is important to communicate to the patient and his family. The goal of a two-stage revision is eradication of infection and re-establishment of a pain-free and well-functioning joint. The factors to consider before going to a two-stage are now that one stage is also becoming popular, though not many people in the suburbs are doing it. Two-stage should be, all chronic infection should be considered as deep, nothing like superficial infection. You must know the time difference between the index surgery, any previous surgeries that the patient has undergone, ACL, arthroscopy, steroid injections. Look at the host factors. What is the patient protoplasm? What are the state of the soft tissues? Call a plastic surgery required. What is the implant loosening bone loss to consider your reconstruction? Try and identify the pathogen through aspiration, multiple aspirations, arthroscopic biopsy. Can you do it yourself? Or as Mukesh said, call a buddy and do it as a dual surgeon and always temper the patient expectations. Know what the family wants, expects, because everybody wants a successful five-star surgery at the cheapest rates and 100% guarantee, which is not possible. So... Options, as we have discussed, is DARE, a single-stage revision. I will talk on two-stage revision and leave the next stage, salvage procedures to Solanki. But remember, in all this currently, two-stage revision is a gold standard of care. The first stage is removal of implant, what is known as explantation, radical debridement, synovectomy, use of antibiotic-laden cement spacers, spend a period of time with antibiotic treatment and antibiotic-free uh, interval, then do your second stage re-implantation with antibiotic cement. A possible redebridement and a redo stage one must always be kept in mind. If you do this, you will have a more than 80% success rate. The indications are all the contraindications of single stage. Plus when a patient has sepsis, you can't do single stage. You have to go for a two stage. It's obviously infected, but organism not identified. As Mukesh said, identifying the organism is key to a single stage. But remember, Vivek has explained to us that you may be facing a polymicrobial infection rather than a single microbe. Make sure the bug is not antibiotic resistant. Sinus tract, think of two stage. Poor soft tissues, think of two stage. Aspiration, we all do. Sometimes patients cannot afford in our setup. I go to multiple setups, patients with multiple budgets. Remember here, we are talking practical stuff as well. Once aspiration, you can have up to 60% accuracy and I'm using about accuracy rather than sensitivity specificity repeated aspiration up to three times increases your pickup rate but remember the cost to the patient because every time you aspirate there is cost of theater cost of surgeon cost of microbiology and always look for tuberculosis as well in our setup arthroscopic biopsy is well described in literature not practically followed much in the suburbs because that's another surgical procedure to the patient but if the patient is affording a biopsy with aspiration combination leads to 90% accuracy in pickup of the bug that is causing the infection. At any of these procedures, aspiration, biopsy, one must keep the patient off antibiotics for two weeks 
to get an accurate pickup. The first stage I would like to tell you is doing arthrotomy using the original scar, extent if required, any vaster snip if required, osteotomy if required, send any fluid obtained for culture, do a radical debridement, Girish has shown us, uh, Mukesh has eludated again, radical debridement, synovectomy, remove the implants carefully without causing any iatrogenic bone loss, use of stacked osteotomes, gilly saw uh, is uh, useful. Also note that in infection, you may find implants are a little loose and that will work in your favor. Remember to ream the canal to look, get rid of the biofilm, do copious lavage with normal saline or dilute betadine if you believe in it. There is some evidence as Sanjay has shown us. Biopsy from multiple sites, from synovium tissue behind each implant. Now remember, the ideal way is to use instruments for the biopsy and not reuse them, which means having multiple sets of instruments, which may not be possible in all our setups. If you send five to six biopsies, you need to five to six nibblers and faucets, which you do not reuse, which is not practical because you're still in the dirty part of the operation and not yet come to the clean part where you will need a separate set of instruments. Send all samples for aerobic, non-aerobic cultures. Uh, think of tuberculosis, ask for a prolonged uh, culture. Once you have finished the, all this carefully, then redrape and re-gown re as we have shown, use new drapes and new instruments. Before you, and also biofilm has been talked of. So this is part of the first stage where you make sure you curate out the biofilm, you scrub out the biofilm, you ream out the biofilm, but get rid of it by hook or by crook. Carefully excise it in the intramedullary cavities. Remember, cement has gone more than your implant. Try and go around it. The common pathogens, our friend Staph aureus, Epidermidis, gram-negative, and the last, fungal and cox. Remember them. Spacers. Coming to spacers, the spacers are used to prevent soft tissue length and to preserve the planes during dissection. They are very useful. Originally, non-articulating spacers were used as Mukesh has shown us a few x-rays. Nowadays, most people are trying to use articulating spacers. Articulating spacers can be custom made on table or can be prefabricated. The advantage of dynamic spacers is the mobility. And there is literature, literature to suggest that if you use dynamic spacers, your range of motion post-operatively is better. Recovery is faster. Most cement have gentamicin and vancomycin. And we have seen what Mukesh has shown us, the pan palacos G plus V. But you can occasionally add tobramycin. Which one to use will be decided by discussion with your microbiologist and your physician and the patient's creatinine levels as well. Some people are using re-sterilized implants or a cheaper Indian implants as a temporary spacer and loosely cement them to tide over the up till stage two. This is uh, how I make my pre, I make my on table custom molded depending on the size, use these molds, use multiple mixes of cement, add antibiotics as necessary. And sometimes you need to extend your uh, spacer by using small wires and uh, putting cement around that. Antibiotic beads are useful. These are self-absorbing. And this uh, X-ray is courtesy Vivek. The interval between two stages, we need to have a period of IV antibiotics depending on culture reports. There are some centers now which are using local uh, antibiotics delivered through local catheters to avoid the side effect of IV, but they give the same duration of three to six weeks. There is a possibility of oral antibiotics if the organism is less virulent and if you are not happy doing a single stage, uh, but there must be antibiotic free period before which before the second stage. Also, one must consider aspiration prior to the second stage and look at the synovial white cell count. Serial, serially monitor your blood markers, white cell count, ESR, CRP, Though literature suggests they're not useful, as Sanjay told us, the trend in all this is very important. And I will show you that in one of my cases. The second stage is arthrotomy, same scar. Again, send samples for tissue sampling. Do a frozen section with a friendly pathologist sitting in the recovery. And if there are less than five PMN per high power field, proceed to the surgery. If there is any doubt, you will have to do de debridement and stop at stage one again. And communicating this to the patient, the family, and the cost involved need to be considered. Persistent infection, you will not proceed. Remove the spacers carefully, avoiding any bone loss or rupturing tendons because by now they would have some adhesions. Send multiple samples again so that 
you are sure you have got rid of it. I know the results will come after your surgery, but always look at them and do copious lavage. At this stage, you must regown new instruments, redrape because now you are coming to the clean part of the surgery where you will reimplant with reconstruction of bony defects and account for ligament damage. Keep hinge instrument, keep hinge implants ready. Carefully close your soft tissues as they are the key now to prevent your infection. As I said, if required, keep a plastic surgeon close by and think of prolonged course of antibiotics, even though literature may suggest that 24 hours may be enough because you're going to wait for your culture reports. And if the, any of the culture reports are positive, you have you will be having sleepless nights. So use antibiotics as required. What are the results? Literature, majority of them have more than 80% success rate, except if you see Pelt et al. at 66% and Gooding Motazari had less than 80%. Otherwise, multiple papers, including Freeman, who was one of the and, uh, pioneers and Fares Sadar, all are crossing 80% for a two-stage revision done carefully following the principles of a two-stage revision. I just want to show you, these are the chronic infections. Do not do a DARE procedure. Sinuses are present. Patients have come at a late stage. And even though it looks like a simple stitch abscess superficial, look at the year if you see the simple, think of the depth of the infection with the erythema. Always cases are not, this is a straightforward case. If you see patient had ACL surgery done once, once upon a time, came, had a TKR done. You can see the lysis under the tibia. Look at the lysis behind the femur. Uh, first stage done with a spacer with antibiotic beads, revised to a second stage with sleeves and rods. This is Vivek's case. I would not want to show you one of my cases from the UK experience, a standard pre-op OANE standard TKR done using a, a single piece of plastic molded onto a, a tibia. This is AGC knee. You can see the lysis under the medial tibia and you can see the changes behind the femur and the patella. Look carefully at the skyline view. The usefulness here you can see the lysis behind the patella. Patient had articulated spacer, single stage, but look at the cement just above the implant and you will see that cement has been placed under the between the quadriceps in the femur to prevent adhesions between the quadriceps and the femur. This is a good trick if you want to use it. The patella has also been removed, and then at six to eight weeks, the patient is converted to a second stage implant. However, I want to show you something not always simple. This is a 70 year old lady. She had a TKR done 18 months prior to seeing me with a discharge from the wound on and off, has undergone multiple courses of antibiotics, she had pain, there was erythema, and she was not happy with the outcome. This is when she came to me, you can see the sinus is that at the time of knee aspiration, I, as uh, discussed, I do it, the knee aspiration in a laminar flow theater, clean air theater with the patient awake. I try and do three aspirations, patients always cannot afford, and you stop at one. This is her at the time of surgery. Now you can see, I'm showing you a video, you can see the front of the knee looks a little bumpy. You can see that the Knee is now clean. I've gone through the ESR, CRP, white cell. Clinically, patient is ready for a second stage. And the reason why the knee looked funny was the spacer had dislocated. This is when she came back. She had gone away after the first stage because the infection was controlled. She was happy staying with, at home, delaying the second stage. But when this happened, she had to come. Luckily, she came very quickly and there was not a lot of soft tissue uh, contractures. And I could reconstruct her knee using some wedges for a, at the distal femur and the posterior femur. Uh, this was the biggest poly. And because of cost constraints, I could not put any uh, uh, wedges behind the tibia. And I had to use the biggest poly. She was left with a slightly lax knee, but her infection was controlled. She's now six years down the line. And when I met her in Calcutta, she was happily... But even though she was wheelchair bound because she has now decided never to have her other knees and shoulder, other knee or shoulders replaced. Originally, she was a four joint candidate and she stopped at one. She's now a low demand lady and is just currently happy with the outcome. This is another 60 year old male who had bilateral TKR at the same sitting. The only difference between the two knees was that the index surgeon had done a bumpectomy of the old Oshgut Schlatter uh, and convinced the patient that is what probably caused the infection. He came to me one year down the line with having gone through multiple courses of antibiotics. This was at the time of aspiration. You can see the sinovitis and the effusion there. And by the time we came for, for the stage one, we had grown an organism. I still decided to do a two stage because it was a chronic infection. 
as you can see the implants came out relatively easily because they were loose and you can see the prefab uh, the custom made uh, spacers in the knee this is after a radical debridement this is what was grown now note carefully the specimen is from tissue behind the tibia plate so i try and send fluid i try and send synovium tissue behind femur tissue behind tibia tissue behind patella try and send at least five samples label them separately this grew staph aureus this was a sensitive organism kept him on antibiotics for 6 weeks but you can see his spacer originally as it was i you can see i left some cement in the tibial hole i did not drill through the cement even though i've told you that should be done because at that stage i thought why violate the canal but you can see at the time he came to me at 6 weeks his spacers were also start started moving and this is how i monitored him you can see the index surgery was in march the stage 1 and i serially monitored his erc esr crp got it down from 105 and maybe stopped his antibiotics at about 6 weeks but then he disappeared he came back in august for his revision about 3 months later and that is when he came because he started getting some pain as his spacers had moved and he had collected money for the second stage you can see his white cell esr crp are down i did his surgery in august but i still monitored them at least for 3 months you can see the findings in september october january and uh, keep make sure that the esr crp falls this is him just before stage 2 you can see his knee how it looks on the night before the second stage you can see how the spacers have moved and the reason he delayed is because you can see this is how he is mobile with the spacers he is not in much pain and is mobile at home i know he has not gone to work for one and a half year now but because he was relatively pain free he managed these are his implants you can see i have built up with wedges on the distal and the posterior femur that's where usually the bone loss is i used this is his revision x ray uh post operatively using antibiotic cement and this is a delayed follow up at about a year and this is his function at a year in my clinic you can see him walking pain free back to work after a two year hiatus and at least smiling and happy now despite all the money he spent what uh, we have given the calculations by pranav so the take home message is carefully select your patients where you're going to do a two stage make sure they are not a single stage candidate make sure you are have a organism where you can give some hope of success i'm not saying guarantee some hope of success do comprehensive counseling of the patient and family very important in our setup under promise over achieve is my motto temper their expectations use a meticulous surgical technique synovectomy debridement antibiotics Be, monitor the patient like a hawk i know some of them disappear and as mukesh showed us even some in the uk disappear after a stage 1 and not to return i remember in my days in the uk i had done a biopsy of a sinus tract of a patient who had a stage 1 and 7 years later he refused stage 2 for we were looking for cancer so monitor your patients monitor their blood serial monitoring charting keep a table all this is lots of hard work sweat sleepless nights take help take help from the gp remember the gp helps communicating with the patient the family we talked of multidisciplinary not always possible here but take help from the microbiologist the physician even the company rep what implants what reconstruction to do and always call your friend to help you at every stage of the of the journey and if you achieve all this meticulously you will end up having a good result and you will sleep well thank you now i'd like to stop sharing my screen and hand over to uh, just before that i would like to one second share again so now that the next talk is from jaipur again what to do yeah uh, what to do when your revision with a single stage or a two stage fails you may have attempted a two stage again if the patient can afford and solanki is originally from a mumbai kar settled in jaipur so you can see his rajasthani mustache but you will see his heart is a mumbai kar so now over to you solanki i'll stop sharing my screen so you can take over uh, thank you tushar for those kind words uh... and let me also thank uh, uh, um, msos and uh, jimulia and uh, gd for inviting me am i now visible or am i not yes okay hear you 
Okay. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Yeah. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Right. Okay. So um, a lot has been said so far. Let me take you through um, what I feel should be an option when everything else fails. We should try. Uh, we, we have options like resection, we can go for an above knee amputation, we can go for an arthrodesis, or we can go for long-term antibiotic separation. Now, uh, primarily I'm going to talk about arthrodesis and uh, resection with cement spacer. So I have two cases to discuss that stepwise uh, as to how we can go about it. And there are various methods one can achieve um, arthrodesis. One is by a long intramedullary fusion nail, which can be antibiotic coated, or you can have a monoaxial or a multi-axial multiplanar uh, fixator, or a simple Chanli type of uh, compression external fixator. Of course, uh, those who are fancy ring fixators, they can use hybrid or a ring fixator. Ring fixator in femur can be a tricky job but uh, one can always go for shan screw and a hybrid construct. You know, as far as um, uh, the debridement antibiotic and implant retention long-term uh, antibiotic separation is concerned, this article, I found it uh, very extensive, which is a review of literature. And they are discussing about the patient factors, duration of symptoms, the microbiology, what procedure uh, can be done, whether it should be done arthroscopic, versus open and they have reviewed a number of articles and given a guideline as to uh, how one can go if uh, no surgical treatment is considered and we are talking only on uh, long-term uh, implant retention with long-term antibiotic uh, separation. We can use either a single or a multiple uh, uh, antibiotics and the choice and duration will depend on the microbiology or a multidisciplinary team approach. So let me take you to the cases. Here is a 64-year-old lady whom I saw in November 2007. She came with pain in the left knee, difficulty in walking, and extreme pain while bending the knee with multiple discharging sinuses. Now, she had a, a, a total knee replacement 14 months ago and uh, uh, with two revision surgeries, two months apart. So probably what, what was the initial presentation was either an acute or a subacute infection which was a surgical site infection. And the index surgeon uh, chose only to do one washout and cyanoectomy initially. And then the second surgery, they did a washout and an exchange spacer. Now the, the problem, her problem was the limb. Uh, she had comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension. These were the parameters. So you can see the polymorphs are around about 70. Though the count is not uh, very high, but her low hemoglobin suggests chronic infection. And the CRP again settles somewhere in the middle range and not like an acute infection above 100. She did have a borderline uh, 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 HbA1c just about seven, uh, at 7.5, and average glucose was sub 200 and with normal uh, renal function. Previous cultures and even our cultures preoperatively, they both show staph aureus. And the sensitivity at the time when I saw was more uh, towards linezolate, moxifloxacin, vancomycin, and piperacillin tazobactam. With two uh, surgeries prior, they had chosen different scars. So the scars were an issue for me. And uh, I, did, I unfortunately don't have previous access because this was done in my outreach uh, a, uh, a clinic uh, and the theater was uh, somebody else's. So here is the case. Now you can see you have a little instability. You can see the virus. You can see sinuses one, two, three, four. I will show you after exposure. And this once uh, exposed, you can see you have lysis around the posterior uh, as well as uh, uh, some of the distal uh, uh, femoral components. And because it was a stiff knee, uh, I just did a, a flip type of a tuber tubercle osteotomy where there is a periosteal hinge here to, to protect the soft tissue. And after extracting, I mean, after removal of the implants, you can see the multiple sinus tracks. So there is one track here, which is going like this. Uh, the one coming from here, another one coming here, uh, just in the posterior capsule. and uh, 
one going obliquely from you know popliteal fossa this this was probably closer to the the vessel uh, but um, uh, fortunately it came more medially as you can see as against the vessel which will be somewhere uh, uh, somewhere uh, somewhere just here uh, and um, uh, there's one coming uh, right uh, at the at the anterior aspect of the uh, of the tibia so this is on the thorough debridement. You could see that not much of bone loss was seen after ex uh, explantation. And I was just checking the alignment in terms of and the bone contact. Uh, I usually will also sprinkle vancomycin uh, 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 posterior to the capsule, uh, most of the gutters, and uh, also some into the intramedullary portion of the bone and uh, also in the patella. And then this was the alignment on table to see uh, the bone contact. And most of the bone contact you could see was uh, pretty okay medially as well as laterally. So I chose a simple uh, construct uh, of a Chanli type of fixator. And uh, you can see that uh, though I could get a closure, the scar was, the original scar was a zigzag and there was another scar here and uh, there was some puckering of the skin after the closure, but the overall alignment was not bad. Uh, you can see both in AP and lateral uh, photographs. So that's uh, going forward. Just a moment. Okay. So, okay. So this is after wound healing. Uh, you can see now uh, the skin is looking far better than what it was looking previously. The posterior. Uh, sinuses have all healed. The other scars have also not behaved uh, badly and the original surgical scar which was one has healed. We protected her because uh, this is a relatively unstable assembly in terms of rotational uh, stability. So we protected her in a cylinder car. Fortunately, there was no pin track infection. And that's uh, at uh, three months uh, in plaster. This is the X-ray. And at six months post-op now that we have removed the fixator, around four to five months, I think I removed it. And you can see we made a splint for protection and she can help herself. And the raise is only say around 1.5 or one, one and a quarter of an inch, uh, if you see the foot raise. And she's able to do an active straight leg raising. Uh, the, the limb is pretty well aligned. And uh, here is the complete fusion at the end of uh, nine months post-op. So um, she was happy with this because uh, two surgeries, uh, previous surgeries and multiple discharging sinus, foul smelling and pain and disability was her main problem. And uh, uh, after that, she has not seen me. So no news is good news is what I presume. Uh, Another case, uh, this is an 80 year old gentleman. I saw in August, 2011, he came with painful right knee with difficulty in walking and extreme pain on knee bending. And what he said was his main problem was a non-healing ulcer on the anterior medial aspect uh, with uh, a discharge coming from there. He had a history of a total knee replacement 15 months ago, which was done elsewhere. With one revision surgery about uh, almost a year down the line. So this was probably secondary hematogenous spread because he had a febrile illness followed by a swollen knee. And um, there were not, uh, there were no other comorbidity except uh, hypertension, but he did have a limp and he was a relatively frail gentleman. So if you look at the parameters, uh, you can see polymorph just around 71, uh, ESR again somewhere uh, you know, in the mid range, TRP not so high, um, average glucose is 140, HbA1c is normal, normal renal function. He received long-term suppression with an empirical antibiotics because all that was presenting was an intermittent discharging sinus and a non-healing ulcer on the anterior medial aspect uh, of, the, um, uh, of the knee. His preoperative cultures when we took, the, the one which were taken on the previous surgery because he was treated empirically properly. Solanki, your volume is gone. Uh, can you hear me now? Solanki, we can't hear you. Okay, so 
Not at all. Happened to your volume. We can hear him, Tushar. We can hear him very well. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Can't hear you. No, Tushar. There's a problem at your end because we can hear him. We can hear. See, all everybody else is able to hear me, Tushar. Uh, uh, so can you check at your end because? I think I'm okay at my end. Yeah, yeah, I you, don't see any warning. Mulanki, well, can you hear me? Yes, I can, can hear you, you Tushar. Probably you can't hear me. Anyway, uh, let me proceed. If there is any problem, anyone else can also stop here? me. So the pre-operative culture, uh, which we took uh, grown uh, staff, staff aureus, which was sensitive to Genta, Levofloxacin, Linezolid, Doxy, Vanco, and Pipacillin as a backdrop. And after the washout, the patient was put on again antibiotic suppression uh, uh, of the index surgery. I mean, the, the first washout after the uh, index surgery. And he was taking leofloxacin 500 milligrams uh, daily, which I stopped around three weeks prior to surgery before uh, obtaining the samples. So uh, the samples were obtained around two and a half weeks uh, post stopping antibiotics. And then we proceeded for revision surgery. So here is a case. So that's the May 2010 when he was 79. That's the index surgery. And you can see that the medial bone defect has been built with uh, cement here with an intramedullary lord. And uh, there is an anterior notching which is not visible here, but very clearly visible here. So you can see the, the component uh, uh, placement uh, that there is a significant anterior notching of this uh, femur. And maybe if you look carefully, then you may see some rare fraction here. Uh, and uh, otherwise, it's a relatively well fixed implant. So this was May 2011. Because it was a relatively well fixed implant, the surgeon decided to do an ex uh, only a washout. And I think there was an exchange poly done at that time because the poly sizes are slightly different. So this is a presentation to us. So this is a non-healing ulcer I was talking about. You can see a diffuse swelling of the knee. And uh, I usually, if, whenever possible, I will get a bone scan. We don't have a leukocyte label scanned here in uh, Jaipur. We have to send them to Delhi and not everybody can go there. So uh, the scan is hot. And what you can particularly see that there is one uh, uh, hot spot, which is, which is here. And I will come to that when I am taking you on the table as to what, what, what it actually is. So that's on table. So that's the range of motion I had uh, on table. Uh, this is the um, uh, initial exposure. That's your original uh, ulceration. That's the exposure. And you can see this is the sinus tract communicating. Uh, uh, this is my McDonald's coming out of the sinus tract. And uh, this is the sinovectomy done from a uh, standard approach, medial palpatella. And uh, both gutters were clear. And the hot spot I was referring to on the, uh, on the um, uh, bone scan is actually a posterior huge pocket. You can see a black hole here, and I'm holding the synonym. So there was a pocket here, which was filled of pus. And that's why he probably had a low, whenever he used to walk or something, you know, the pus is to trickle. And because he was on long-term suppression, uh, the overall knee look was not angry, but uh, that used to come as a discharge from the sinus here, and uh, and that used to bother him. And you can see the loosening uh, of the femoral component more so distally and posteriorly, but proximal, uh, the anterior portion is relatively well fixed. So I had to use a giggly saw to uh, to explant, and uh, a copious pulse lavage. This is done only with saline. Uh, and this is the final product after debridement. Now, I did counsel him preoperatively that uh, we'll attempt fusion because he wanted a single surgery and uh, uh, but was not willing for amputation. But I also warned him that if you have a huge gap, then you know uh, it will lead to considerable shortening. And if the bone uh, loss is significant and the contact is not very good, that will also pose the difficulty in achieving final fusion. And I took a permission of using a cement spacer with leaving a second stage option uh, to him, though he was not at all keen on any second stage surgery. He said, no more surgery. Give me single surgery, and that's all. 
So that's after the clearance, uh, and you can see the gap is huge here. Uh, the uh, the standard vancomycin powder about two grams for the pocket as well as the posterior and the gutters. And here is an antibiotic mix immense. And the way to do is an assistant is pulling on the leg, keeping the tension while I'm holding the cement and, and making sure that it's a good fill of the cement and a contact of the bone to, to have stability of the joint. So that's the on-table uh, resection, post-resection uh, IIT review. And that's the completed procedure with the primary suturing. That's our ulcer debrided. And that's the implant in my hand, which we explanted. So here is three months. I mean, this is not three months. This is three months. Uh, this is after, say, around uh, three to four weeks after the suture removal. And you can see the skin is slowly sort of healing. Uh, the, the ulceration is slowly healing with puckering with secondary intention. And at three months, the ulceration has now healed completely. You can see all the swelling around the knee has gone down and the wound has healed with the function. And because the spacer is not totally tight, he can get about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. So that's how it is looking on X-ray, you know, in August. So we are talking one year post-op when I reviewed him. After that, I lost to follow. So the, everything has settled now. So the posterior alignment has settled uh, with fibrosis. The anterior uh, bone loss has been settled with uh, uh, fibrosis around this area. And now he has no limb length discrepancy. He's walking with only a stick and no external support. And you can see maybe very, very slight uh, recurvatum, but no stretching of soft tissues, which can be a problem here. Uh, so take home from these two cases. Um, Infected TKR is a challenging problem, as we all know. It has been discussed extensively. And AK, above knee amputation may be a last resort, but it is less acceptable to patients and may have a very, very challenging rehabilitation, especially in elderly, because uh, the prosthetic part is not easy to wear on its own and uh, also difficult to manage functionally. The arthrodis is a far more acceptable uh, option. Uh, when a single limb is affected, bilateral knee arthrodis is uh, not a good option. But the shortening can be an issue, especially when there is a significant bone loss. So this is my last slide. So cement spacer block after resection can be used as a definitive first stage solution. And Tushar shared a case, so did I think Dr. Mukesh, uh, that Sometimes the patients are happy with single stage and will prolong their second stage for the same reason, because the, the functional, if your ligament balancing is good, the functional result is not bad unless there is something happens, either a dislocation, uh, subluxation, or a fracture of the spacer. And if the uh, tensioning is not proper, there may be a micro movement between the bone cement interface and which will lead to bone resorption and soft tissue stretching. And you may, can, you may have a recurvatum, and that should be kept in mind. So long-term antibiotic suppression can be considered in a well-fixed implant with a relatively low-grade uh, infection, and preferably without a discharging sinus. I thank you for your attention. I hope I'm in time. Yes, Solanki, thank you very much. If you stop sharing your screen now. Yeah, I'll do that. Just a moment. And I'll start I'm sharing the screen. So we saw Mukesh showing us where John Chanli worked. You saw Solanki showing us the Chanli clamps. What a change from replacement to fusion. And now come to the second guest lecture by Gautam Chakrabarti from Huddersfield, England, who is also a Mumbai car at heart and a true suburbanite because he still comes regularly for IROC and lives in Santa Cruz. He's a member of our suburban area. He is currently a senior consultant clinical director in Huddersfield. He's a member of the Committee for Higher Surgical Training, academically involved in Leeds and Huddersfield as a lecturer and professor. He's a member of the SAC of the Royal College of Surgeons. He has been very prominent in the uh, British or Association for Society of Knee Surgery, the BASC, as an honorary secretary from 2009 to 2012. So now over to you, Gautam. Uh, there's lots more I can say about Gautam, but most people know him from Wairock. I'll stop sharing my screen. Gautam is going to talk to us about the UK perspective. Now that we heard a, li a little bit of talk from everybody, Gautam will tell us what the UK protocols and perspective, overall view, the wise old man's view 
as to what how to tackle an infected TKR. Over to you, Gautam. Uh, thanks, uh, Tushar. I was thinking that my time will come. It's coming, it's late. Aaya. Thank you for waking up at 5 a.m. <laughs> no, no, uh, it's an honor and uh, it's really it's a pleasure to actually be with you guys and seeing so many faces from Jaipur and the time that I... The Tagore Hospital has become so big from yeah. the time I first attended. Uh, GD, my heartfelt condolences to you. Uh, uh, but it takes a GM site to prop up the KMIT. So there you go. <laughs> GM site has the last say. So yeah, chakaraka. I'm going to try and share my screen. And uh, it's going to be a repetition of what everybody has said. So I've learned a huge amount in the last couple of hours. So thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, So let's go share screen. It's not happening. Any suggestions? It's not picking it up. Ah, okay. Yeah, can you see now, now? You can see. Yeah, yeah, now we can see. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, um, the UK perspective, I think Mukesh has already done my job. So this is going to be a, quite a cool job to finish off. Um, but I'll try and add a few things and leave you with a few thoughts. So I come from Huddersfield and um, this is where we are in the north of England. Um, known for a lot of things, apart from it being the car park of the north because it's situated on the M62 motorway between Liverpool and Hull. So totally replacement has been a very well accepted management plan for osteoarthritic knees. We've got good long-term results. Most issues have been addressed. The indications have widened. And as Coates and all have suggested by 2030, we'll see about 3 million primary totally replacements being done across the world. Unfortunately, um, when we look at the uh, primary TKR demographics in 2019, USA at almost 800,000 with a rate of 226 knees done per 100,000 population. The UK then 148. And as Tushar mentioned that we've done, you do 100,000 knees in India, but we don't really know what it uh, entails to as far as the population is concerned. I suspect it is very, very low. The incidence of totally replacement has been alluded to several uh, times. Uh, several studies, less than 1% is what we would like, but it can go up to 3%, and that has been uh, 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 reported in several uh, studies and literature. The fact that an infected totally replacement is an increasing burden is probably an understatement. It is financially expensive to the patient. It's a loss-making procedure to the healthcare provider. The healthcare provider doesn't want to hear that he has to do he or she has to fund a private knee replacement. In other developed countries where there is a social backing, it's a major economic burden when the patient can't work. And there is limited evidence to guide to have proper guidance, treatment guidelines. Everything is actually a uh, what happens, we will do this. And the cost of revision total knee replacement of an infected, particularly an infected knee replacement, can be as high as 30,000 pounds in the United Kingdom. I know that's a lot of money in Indian terms, but that is the fact if we take everything else into consideration as well. It is a potentially dev devastating thing, both for the surgeon and for the patient. It's difficult to treat, and that would be a understatement. The outcomes from it can be poor, but what is important is for us to look at it from a completely different angle, that the five-year mortality of an infected uh, joint replacement is about 13%. And this is higher than three most common solid cancers, breast, prostate, and melanoma, as described by Parvezi et al. And if we are ready to spend and invest so much time, and quite rightly so, in the management of those three cancers, we need to actually do that for the same for the infected total knee, infected joint replacement. And this actually gives, enhances the role and the need for multidisciplinary team management, which has already been alluded to. 
When we look at the NJR, and this is from the 17th report, which came out in September 2020, uh, I apologize, my painting hasn't been particularly good, but it highlights infection and aseptic loosening, the revision of the implant, as particularly as far as uh, the, in terms of when they were done. And you can see less than one year, infection as a um, um, cause of revision is higher. Whereas when it goes down to more than 15 years, aseptic loosening takes over. And you would expect that to be the way forward. When we look at the type of implant, as in whether it's an uncemented, hybrid or cemented, you see a kind of different, uh, slightly different picture as well. So what are the principles of management? And we've heard about this again and again. And the first one is to consider, are we going to eradicate or cure the infection? The idea is to take away the pain because that is often what they actually come to you with. Maintain the range of movement that they have presented and restore joint function. And whilst I put maintain range of movement and joint function next to each other, they are not exactly the same, but slightly different. Joint function is what the patient actually expects out of his joint. Minimize the mortality and the morbidity because that is what the patient is really bothered about. It has to be a shared decision-making process. And I understand that in India particularly, that may often be quite difficult, but I believe that going forward, that will become absolutely mandatory. It needs an individualized plan. It's not where one plan fits everybody and that's what we need to do. And I emphasize again, the need for us to develop a multidisciplinary team approach. So what is cure? I was looking up the definition and Wikipedia says, a cure is a substance or procedure that ends all a medical condition, the state of being healed. And in PGI terms or prosthetic joint infection terms, it would be defined as a freedom from clinical signs and symptoms of infection, normal biochemical markers, and no further medical or surgical treatment required at two years post-treatment, i.e. back to complete normality, with normality being in inverted commas. And that's what our aim need to be, our aim, goal needs to be too. We've heard extensively about how to diagnose. I think the first thing about diagnosis is an index of suspicion. Knee pain, as Sanjay has already alluded to, persistent effusion needs to get you thinking. Don't push away that early painless loosening. Even if you're not convinced, I think a sooner X-ray is more important rather than come back in a year's time. There may be more obvious signs and that may make it more easy. A drainage and a sinus formation should leave you with no doubt at all. And hopefully you would never see somebody appearing to you or presenting to you with frank sepsis. So what happens in the UK? We predominantly follow the 2013 consensus devised by Parvezi et al. CRP and ESR is a given. Plasma viscosity occasionally is added. There is usually a reluctance by the chemical pathologist to do all three. CRP and ESR go, um, is now accepted and they don't complain. But in plasma viscosity, they may complain about it because it costs money. In your setup, the patient pays, in our setup, the government pays. And there's always that final green note which comes into play. It has also been described now, labs who have got the ability to evaluate synovial fluid should be, doing, should be involved in the process. And in the UK at the present time, certainly in my DGH, we do not have that facility. So if I have to do something like that, I need to speak to my microbiologist, I need to speak to my chemical pathologist and tell them in advance that this is what I intend to do. We've heard about the aspirate going into blood culture bottles and not just into sterile pots. That is extremely important. Five surgical specimens, separate instruments. Contamination by instruments is very, very dangerous because you could just get a contaminant from the skin and that would throw you out completely. I did hear about the nibbler a bit, and I put it to you that you don't always require five nibblers, but you would require five pairs of forceps and five knives. Knife blades are not that expensive in the grand scale of things. The histopathology samples. We tend, particularly in India, to push away histopathologists. Having been married to one for the last 30 years, I know how important they are in actually helping us with the diagnosis of um, any form of um, uh, 
disease, including infection. And having a histopathologist to, with whom you have constant uh, liaison is even perhaps even more important. Think about additional cultures for fungal and mycobacterium. Perhaps in the UK, we don't put that as number one, but in India, you need to think of that probably straight away. What else in the UK? Plain imaging is absolutely mandatory. Plain, plain imaging and those in comparison with the previous ones really tells you a lot. We are at an advantage that we work in a setup where the imaging is available or can be made available if the previous imaging was done elsewhere. That system does exist. Unfortunately, although India has got digital imaging, I think it is still a little bit behind in trying to be able to transfer those images from one to the other. The role of bone scan has always been an iffy one. And really today, bone scan is of not much use. It certainly isn't of any use in the first 24 months. If at all, it can come into play subsequently. And as uh, uh, Solanke has just shown, that it is probably more the white cell label scan, which is more important than the plain Indian scan. But what is probably more important today and more specific today is a SPECT CT. And whilst I have no access to this in, um, um, in the UK, in Yorkshire, I'm sure there are centers in India which will offer this. And there probably is more than one SPECT CT in the city of Mumbai. The role of MRI scan, uh, and particularly the metal artifact reduction scan is extremely important, but it also depends on the amount of scatter that you get and how it is interpreted. There was a question earlier on in the chat, which I didn't answer, but I would not like to tell you that in an acute setting, the role of an MRI scan is of a much use. It is one in the case of a loosening and where you want to determine whether it's actually loose or not. So determine between aseptic loosening or a subtle chronic infection. The description by Parvezi et al. is very well recognized. It's been extensively spoken about today, and I'm not going to go through it. Yes, I agree. A sinus tract is a definite source of infection, and that is probably the one um, factor that tells you about it. You don't need to know anymore whether the knee is swollen or not, if it is draining, if it, it, it is infected. The other parameters are as follows, and you need to have two majors and four minors or combination thereof to tell you that the knee is infected. And I'm not going to dwell on that anymore, but except for the fact that we actually do use it in, in the United Kingdom. I would like to draw to your attention these factors, which are compromising factors, which actually influence infection as well. And these are the local factors, host factors, and some of the organisms. And I'll come, come back to the organisms again at a later day, at a later point. So what are the patient-related risk factors? This, these have been alluded to as well. We do pay a lot of attention to this. Smoking, diabetes, although these are important, these do not exclude a patient if they actually need total knee replacement or if subsequently they become infected and need further management. The buzzword today is MDT. The MDT is not made, by the, uh, made up of the single orthopedic surgeon but a group of orthopedic surgeons. In my unit, where we are 17 of us and eight of us do arthroplasty, each and every one of us actually are present, um, unless we are on leave or we've got some other commitments. And the case is openly discussed. And I'll show you a slide right at the end. This is, where, and, and this is one place where the ego needs to be out of the room and it needs to be openly discussed. The role of the infectious diseases consultant is very important particularly when you have an abnormal bug that has been isolated to understand how to deal with them and how it may have made its way into the joint. In the UK, you cannot just provide uh, or prescribe antibiotics because you like a particular brand. It has to be guided by the microbiologist. And I put it to you that there is a lot to be said about that so that it's taken away from our hands. I have seen across in India that the the uh, enthusiasm of putting on uh, putting the patient on the highest level of antibiotic straight away and that perhaps is wrong you're dealing with the antibiotic resistance straight away you are altering things for the future in a negative sense 
the rehabilitation specialists, the physiotherapists in our setup play the huge role. And so do they in your setup. And they need to be involved right from the beginning as to how you are going to get this patient going. The role of the pathologist, I've already alluded to. Imaging and the radiologist, I've alluded to. And don't forget the plastic surgeon. In case you've got a difficult scar that requires excision, in case you find that you cannot actually close the wound, you need to be involved and need him to be involved right from the very beginning. We heard about classification. And for the sake of um, um, completion, I've included Sukhyama and McPherson as two classifications which are good, but perhaps not very helpful from the management point of view. This is perhaps more um, applicable from the management point of view. Type one, where it's early post-operative, two, where it's chronic, acute hematogenesis three, and type four, when you accidentally find an, um, an infection when whilst you're doing a one-stage revision for what you thought was aseptic loosening and lysis. The role of aspiration has already been alluded to, and I put it to you, it could be done arthroscopically, arthroscopically or a needle aspirate, but it needs to be done in theater. You need to have the patient to be antibiotic free, and that has to be, that has to be, that has to be a minimum period of two weeks, as Tushar has already alluded to that. There is absolutely no point in aspirating a knee where they do it once or thrice if the patient has already been on antibiotics. You must wait. You must wait. You must repeat the CRP whilst the patient is on the antibiotics, and you must repeat the CRP whilst they've come off the antibiotics at the end of two weeks before you aspirate. You then inoculate them into appropriate culture medium, and that includes the uh, bl um, blood culture bottles. And this needs to be done in discussion with the microbiologist, and that is what happens in the UK. The UK organisms are no different. The English bugs are no different to the Indian bugs. In the acute setting, Staph aureus is responsible for 20 to 60% of the infection, and coagnex staph in 20%, with 5% of gram-negative bacilli. The delayed bit is coag-negative staph, polymicrobial, culture-negative, but we do le see less fungal, 0.5%, and probably even less frequently is mycobacterium. And that's where it actually is probably different. Culture negative is a source of irritation to everybody, particularly the surgeon, because you want an answer, you, you want to make a plan. And you may find that this is often 20% of patients where there is equally no evidence of infection, but the patient has got a painful knee, they're grumbling, uh, it's not particularly warm, it's a bit swollen, they've got pain, they've got restricted uh, motion, as Sanjay alluded to right in the very beginning, that take these things into consideration. It almost feels that it is infected, but you can't put your finger on it. One of the reasons why that can be is because of previous antibiotic therapy, or they may be on, on a concomitant immunosuppressive therapy for other reasons. The prince, if they are a diabetic and their blood sugar is not very well controlled. And in that case, you need to repeat the investigations again and again. And if it is the same lab, perhaps use another lab. And that could be done even in the UK with collaboration, with consultation with your chemical pathologist or your microbiologist. I again emphasize to you that you must withhold the antibi um, antibiotics. There's no role for actually doing all these investigations whilst the antibiotics are still going. And eventually consider the role of a polymer PCR um, uh, test or a DNA test for the um, organisms to see whether a, a particular um, antibiotic sensitivity can be isolated. So what happens as a surgical approach? We've again heard about this quite extensively. We do take, tend to take five separate um, uh, specimens from various places. And my uh, personal routine is that everything is divided into two. So if I'm taking tissue from the synovium, it is divided to go to the histopathologist and to the microbiologist. There is no role for a culture swab. A culture stick does not give you anything at all. If you want to take a sample, take some proper juicy fluid, even if it doesn't look infected, send, uh, aspirate 10 mils of the fl synovial fluid and send it across to the laboratory. The microbiology samples needs to be in clear pots and in blood culture bottles. And I apologize for keeping on uh, repeating this. 
the length of the culture in the UK, a standard culture is just 48 hours. And after 48 hours, if no organism is grown, the chapter is closed. And this is where speaking to the microbiologist and the microbiology technician on day one is extremely important. There's no point in going back to them after 48 hours when the sample has actually been thrown out and the plates have also been got rid of. And if you tell them in advance, they will continue to cook it for a longer period of time. But more importantly, there is a laid down standards, the UK standards of microbiological investigations through a government document published in June 2014, which needs to be followed. And that is the basis on which all laboratories in the United Kingdom are actually assessed. We've heard extensively about adequate debridement, and there's nothing further for me to add on that. The need for thorough lavage goes without saying, and the antibiotic therapy. It depends on if you've got a preoperative sample and a culture, then you start with the same antibiotics, or we start empirically thinking on what it is likely to be, and then change the antibiotics fairly soon. There's a lot of debate as to whether you need to give them intravenous and oral and actually, when you look at long-term results, there is no difference between oral and intravenous antibiotics. Occasionally, we have to continue with intravenous antibiotics because they are not available in the oral form. But the system available in the UK is that we can send these patients home and we can provide them with outpatient antibiotic therapy or OPAT, which is a significant benefit in terms of cost, particularly as they are not occupying a bed. So what are the other management options? Debridement, irrigation, poly exchange, uh, similar to the DARE bit, and I'll come to DARE bit again. We've talked, we've heard about single or two-stage revisions. We've heard about resection arthroplasty, arthrodesis, amputation, and long-term antibiotic suppression. And it's not my remit to talk about each one of them, but I've just listed what we, what we do in the UK. So when you look at the revision rates, and this has already been alluded to by Mukesh, and I'm not going to try and explain this again. It's very important to see just 8% we have dares, and a lot of it is single stage revision of 72%. And as he has explained, and we've also learned from uh, the others, that there is a difference between, um, bet between the first stage and the second stage uh, procedures, or the rate of it. So we've heard extensively about dares. And that is the cure rate between 50 to 75%, but it is important. On your right-hand side of the screen are the relative contraindications that you need to take into consideration before you actually embark upon a, day, um, a DARE procedure. One stage revision has got a lot of advantage, advantages, single, stage, uh, single admission, financial savings, avoid pain and morbidity in between procedures, reasonable success rate, but increased risk of function. On the other hand, with a two-stage revision, you've got better chance of eradication, but there is the pain in between procedures and the fact that some of them may get lost. The financial implications are extensive, both to the insurance company, to the country, as in the UK, and more importantly, to the patient. It is, after all, double morbidity, and the poor mobility in between can be quite soul destroying although we have seen examples as shown by Tushar and uh, Dr. Salanki that they do reasonably well. The need for repeated blood tests and potentially poor function if they are lost. And in our system, the, big pre the, the main reason for getting lost is our waiting time. And I can tell you that COVID-19 has not done us any favors, but may have done you guys some favors because one thing's clear off, there might be increased uh, medical tourism between the UK and India if we can share a bubble. We've heard extensively about salvage, arthrodesis, amputation, and there is certainly a role for long-term antibiotics to keep the um, infection suppressed in a patient where further surgery is just out of question. So this is the first case, uh, one of my cases with an infected uni, and you can see you don't get a um, articulating spacer. So this is one that I made myself and then eventually revised it using a cruciate retaining uh, femoral component and just using a medial wedge and a stem to reconstruct the knee. A similar, and one of the, an early failure from one of my colleagues. And I somehow feel that this implant, particularly on the tibial component, has a tendency to become loose very early. 
and that could be because of the increased slope. I've got some theories on it, and particularly if you do a sacrificing variety of it, there is more uh, tibia loosening. There was a comment as to whether we should put uh, these um, uh, cement in the intermediary. I'm a strong believer of that, and you can see my mushroom um, or T-shaped golf tees that I tend to put. I have had my fingers burned by putting them all in one and I'm not separating them because then it just breaks and it becomes a huge um, a problem. And I strongly believe that you must open up the intermediary canal because that's the only way that the antibiotics will actually reach. And this has been revised to a, a, a TC3 with a sleeve. And a similar example here, this is one of my own patients where I misread that lysis eventually turned out to be infected um, and over to, uh, um, uh, over a two-stage procedure, it's been reconstructed. I don't have the facility to do a one-stage revision. I do all my infected knees that are referred to me um, as a two-stage procedure. I'm just gonna digress for a little bit. We've talked about how to manage an infected knee. I think we need to go back a step further, go back a step back and look at surgical side infections. It is the most preventable hospital acquired infection, healthcare acquired infection with the substantial financial burden and it's two to 20 times higher in lower income group and middle income group countries. And that's probably where we actually see why it is so high um, um, in not just, and, and this is not me talking about infected joint replacement, but infection as a whole in the, um, in, um, within in the Indian subcontinent. And it's the second most common in higher income group countries as well. And organisms have 60% have antibiotic resistance. And this is something that we need to be mindful of. We need to understand what the pathogenesis is, the bacterial contamination, the virulence and the resistance of the patient. And we do have a role to play in trying to alter a few of these, in fact, all three of these characteristics. How do we prevent this in the UK? And these are the four steps. And the patient counseling and career um, um, with the carer starts right from the very beginning, from the time that they are actually consented through clear, consistent information, advice, how to look after the wound after discharge, how to recognize an SSI, and inform about antibiotics at the time of surgery as well. The preoperative phase has been alluded to. Gone are the days when I, as a resident in JJ, used to write shaving from nipple to knee. That cannot happen. That cannot happen the day before. If you actually shave the, day, um, uh, uh, shave the area with a clipper just before surgery, the risk of infection is 3.1%. If you do it 24 hours before, it increases to 24% as a source of infection. And that's what we need to be mindful of. The rest of it has already been alluded to. The role of antibiotics in the UK at the present time, we just give one dose of tycoplanin and use gentamicin um, uh, impregnated cement and nothing else at all. The rest of it has already been alluded to. I don't think there is a role for a three-day antibiotic. And I thought Dr. Ardeker made that point beautifully. And I really, really implore upon you to look upon why you are giving antibiotics for three days. It doesn't make sense. The intraoperative phase has already been alluded to as well. And it is imperative that the telephones are not answered. It is not a, a telephone exchange. The operating theater is not a telephone exchange. It is an operating theater. There needs to be pin drop silence. And there is a voicemail for to pick up all these messages and that can be uh, dealt with after the surgery. The post-operative phase, change of dressings. In the UK now, we put a dressing on in theater and we don't actually take that off unless there is a seepage through the, um, it actually stains the dressing. Um, and there is absolutely no role to take it out and say how beautiful your handiwork is. In the presence of clips, your handiwork can't really be appreciated. It's only appreciated at the very end. There's no role for topical antibiotics. I've seen that in India a lot in the periphery. Please, that is not required at all. When you take the sutures, don't leave it for too long. If you've used clips, you may take alternate ones out early at the 10 day mark and take the rest out at the 14 day. And we do have access and probably one of the good things is the specialist wound care services 
and the tissue viability nurse. Wound assessment is extremely important and I've already alluded to that um, in the previous two slides. There is a standardized infection ratio for our hospitals and we are very mindful of that. And I put it to you, we are asked this question all the time, how safe is your hospital? And I think the time has come for all Indian surgeons to embark upon and ask particularly the corporate hospitals to explain how safe they are from the infection point of view. Surgical site prevention is extremely, extremely important and it entails a number of things. I'm hoping that COVID-19 has taught us to wash our hands even better than what we did. And if we are, if our hands are the source of contamination, it will hopefully decrease. These are the references that I've alluded to. I'm gonna leave you with this last two slides. If you've got suspected infection, and this is something which is going to appear in print in the next couple of weeks from BASC, the knee division working group, and that's where I've got this from. Aspiration, a biopsy diagnosis through an MDT process. If it's an acute infection and it's suitable for DARE, then you go ahead and do a DARE or you consider a two-stage revision. If it's a non-acute infection, then indication for single stage, two-stage, or salvage, as I have described. This is what a fairly simplistic way of a guide to actually deal with infection. Infection surgery is ego-free surgery. And before you enter theater, the one thing that needs to be left behind is ego. Have no ego to ask for help. Please ask for help. It is not a single man procedure. It is joint operating, joint decisions. Two brains work better than one as far as trying to manage an infected knee replacement or for that matter, any complication. Share my final slide. In conclusion, your index of suspicion needs to be high. Try to get an organism, use antibiotic with care, be aggressive with your debrimo. Respect soft tissues at all times. Know the criteria. Avoid the head in the sand, as GD has already alluded to. If in doubt, wash it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gautam. If you can stop sharing your screen. I'll share mine. So thank you, Gautam, for a very good overview uh, of all the, what we have learned today. And uh, I think we are running late. So we will not have a panel discussion. That is what Satish has told me. And he's the secretary of the association. So now I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Ram Prabhu for, and Satish Muta for giving me the opportunity. I would like to thank the Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society, all my panelists, especially Solanki from Jaipur, uh, Gautam and Mukesh from UK, but also my fellow co-moderator Girish because he had a personal uh, tragedy three days ago and still he uh, did not fall back on his commitment to join us today. So I would like to thank everybody today for joining us uh, as, despite the time differences and uh, hope everybody enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. Over to you, Satish, for the final word of thanks. Thank you, Tushar. Uh, it was really an informative session and uh, a lot of air in my mind is now clear about how to tackle a post-op infection in a TKR. I must specifically thank Dr. Gautam Chakrabarti, Dr. Mukesh Emadi. Uh, we have disturbed you at really odd hours in the morning and I hope you get a chance to catch up with this lost sleep. I thank Tushar and the entire team for so meticulously discussing the topic thread, but the topics were really well chosen and the talks were really interesting. Uh, Ashok tells me that there are almost 1,600 people logged in on various platforms through Ortho TV and uh, MSOS, which is a really nice number. I should also thank Ashok Sham for helping us with his Ortho TV platform and being with us throughout the program and streamlining it. And last but not the least, I must thank the Swizera team who have helped us set up this uh, weekly webinar series and enabling us to conduct it smoothly. 
So thank you, Tushar. Thank you, the entire team on behalf of MSOS and Dr. Ram Prabhu, who unfortunately could not join us because he's traveling. So thanks, everyone. We're running a little short of time, so we will have to skip the Q&A session. But it was a really interesting webinar. And uh, I hope everybody has thoroughly enjoyed it. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Thank Tushar. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Dr. Thanks. Bye. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you.